Hello, chaps. This is Thersites the Historian. I'm joined tonight by Sean Chick, and we'll be looking at the British Generals World War I. For reasons we'll get into a bit, we will not be able to actually complete this list of 30 generals tonight, so this will end up being a two-parter. Um, we've both been extremely busy, especially the last few weeks, and um, so what we're going to do is stick with strictly the figures from this period we can cover adequately, and then in the future we'll come back and hit the other ones. So, uh, sorry about that. I Originally, of course, we had intended to cover everyone, but, well, you know, life happens. Uh, today was the first time I've been able to open up my notes on this since March 29th, because I've been absolutely slammed with this uh, course I've been teaching this, like, at an advanced pace, and is non-stop in terms of having to grade and put out content and deal with students and all that. Uh, and I mean, Sean's been equally busy, as he can attest. Um, and also, I we're probably going to change the format and do about every other week, right, Sean? Yeah, yeah, just, um, just don't have the free time I once did uh, with uh, work, writing, and... Um, uh, certain like social groups finally you know getting off their ass and doing stuff you know yeah no I do know um, <laughs> yeah it, it's uh, anyway and I don't know I mean we'll we'll see and I, I might still do shows on Sundays even when Sean can't make it so it depends on my schedule and if I can find other people to stream with and you know just different factors I don't want to go into now so anyway now we got that out yeah. of the way. We can I did have a question for you. Yeah, what's up? Who's the British guy in the image? Uh, that, for the, is, uh... that is an actor who was playing Douglas Haig in Wonder Woman. <laughs> <laughs> I was surprised you didn't use Blackadder. Yeah, I thought about that, but I decided to go with something that might potentially trick someone. <laughs> so, yeah, thought I'd go a little bit more contemporary with that. Um, I couldn't find any good group photos of the British generals, as we'll discuss. A lot of these guys actually don't like each other very much, so those photos are pretty hard to find. So, yeah, there's a lot of backbiting and horse shit, just like with other armies we've uh, talked about. And uh, one thing I'd like to do before we jump into the list proper, before we get to the genius of John French and some of the other commanders. I would like to talk about, or at least go through the super chats I got on the first triumvirate stream a couple weeks back. So we'll do those really fast and then get into the action. We'll get into the trenches. I mean, who's actually in a hurry to get into the trenches? We all know what the conditions were like. Okay, so we have Richard Leston for 4.99. He had no comment, but I think him anyway. Taco Cruiser had $2, and he said, Would you prefer Daylight Savings Time or Standard Time all year? Do you have a preference, Sean? Uh, I'm against Daylight Savings Time. I think this is a, a barbaric practice that's only there because of some, what, like year, decades back, some person thought this was more efficient, you know? Um, yeah, um, I don't have super strong feelings on it. I guess I don't really care too much, um, but I will say that I tend to prefer daylight savings time actually just because I like it to still be light out at say 7 o'clock. Um, so that's just kind of my personal preference. You you like it being light at 7 o'clock, huh? Yeah, I do, because I don't want to have to stumble around in the dark. Um, yeah, I... I dog out or whatever. Yeah, I have total preference for the dark. I don't like the sun. Um, I stay in the shade every minute I can. Um, yeah, I, I don't like the sun at all. Well, don't know. Yeah, just thing for me, man. I, sunlight makes other people happy. I just go, oh, God, more of this shit. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess you do live in Louisiana, though, so that's a different perspective. <laughs> You got people. I mean, you got people down here who love the, all this stuff. I mean, they don't like the humidity. They may like they may like the sunlight. You know. Yeah. Uh, the only thing that's ridiculous is it'll be July or August. You have one of those cloudless days around here, and the sun. But like, isn't today pretty? I'll be like, Are you insane? Are you nuts? <laughs> <laughs> wow. 
Well, this is, the, this is the ugliest thing you can see in Louisiana as a cloudless sky in August. Although this past winter was cold as hell, so uh, anytime the sun was out, at least it would be a few degrees warmer. And uh, you know, now that I got a dog, I have to take him out a lot, so I have to deal with the weather constantly. So yeah, that would be more of a pain with snow, of course. Um, yeah. But I, 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 I like the cold a lot. I hate, I fucking hate cold weather to the point that I mean, I know the yeah, heat yeah. down there is really bad. I think I, I'm physically better able to tolerate heat than I am cold, though. Although my girlfriend's the exact opposite; she faints in heat a lot of times. It, can, it actually wiped me out Thursday. I did a tour for these guys at the uh, Shamet Battlefield for Battle New Orleans. Yeah. And uh, it was our first... Re- Thursday was our first genuinely hot day of the year. Like, you know, like, you're you're in, like, not quite summer heat, but almost there. Uh, and then I had to do two other tours, although they were mostly uh, air-conditioned, at least. Right. Uh, but I fell asleep at 9 p.m. because it just wiped me out. Damn. Uh, I had to... Re- I have to reacclimate to the heat, and it takes a little while. The other thing, too, is um, April is really hard for me because the weather fluctuates a lot. And I kind of actually do better once it gets burning hot because at least I know what to expect every day. Yeah, I guess that's true, too. Uh, you know. Sometimes we said for consistency. Yeah, like you're like, okay, it's going to be this. It's going to, be, it's going to suck. You know what to do. Stay in the shade. Run to the air conditioning units. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh. One of the other super chats actually chimed in on that point. Uh, Akbar Ali for one nine nine said, "Permanent double summertime." Jesus Christ! <laughs> well, you know, I guess somebody has some strong feelings on it. Uh, yeah, I guess it depends on the heat and the sun, you know. Yeah. <laughs> hey, to quote, look, to quote Butthead, the sun sucks. <laughs> yeah, it sucks. Ha <laughs> ha. <laughs> Uh, Boone for two dollars said, "Thank you for all the content. Really nice to listen to. Well, thank you, Boone. I appreciate it." Jeremy Stitz and the Journey twenty dollars. Thank you, sir. He said, "Peak Roman history content. Great content." Well, thank you, sir. And last but not least, we had Wyatt Daughters for nineteen ninety nine, and he said, "Crass is called, and he wants his ad revenue back." Because I gave him an E. <laughs> so all right well thank you everybody who did that stream but now we're on a different stream uh the year is 1914 and the world is about to go to hell so i'll we'll pull up the list real fast we'll take a look at the men we have here i put 30 people on this list and i tried to find the people who are most relevant to the british war effort so those would be army level commanders theater commanders who actually fought the two prime ministers Kitchener I don't I didn't put his successors on here I just don't think they're relevant enough I didn't put Churchill on here I don't think he was quite powerful enough um, and I tried to only go with people who are army level or above I know there was some suggestion early on that we should basically do every Commonwealth contingent senior contingent officers and like that but uh, some of these people are South African or Canadian, but I didn't go through and try to find the senior person from each of the various Commonwealth countries because some of them never got above division or core level, and so they would not really be a very analogous uh, comparison with some of these other people. Nonetheless, we do have a somewhat varied group here, and... Um, what I'd actually like to do is start in one of the subsidiary theaters of the war for Britain, and that would be, of course, in Africa. Um, as I mentioned, I did not get to complete all my research, but I did get to complete that part. So that's why we're doing Africa first. And um, it's also something that's so different than the rest of World War I, so I feel like it deserves a bit more spelling out. Uh, so we'll do that as we discuss the three men who commanded in East Africa. <clears throat> and we will, um, before we do that, let's let's talk generally about some of the controversies about the British Generals of World War One, because I think that that is something that deserves a discussion. I, a lot of Americans probably aren't fully aware of the evolution of that debate. So are you familiar with the controversy about the British Generals as butchers and as uniquely incompetent? Uh, yeah, actually, I read a book about this a uh, long time ago, um, and I always, the, uh, 
the book, as I recall, was um, I'm going to say um, that probably both cases have been overstated because there became this argument that oh no, these guys were great innovators, but um, you know there was also um, how should I say the the um, they were facing unique problems with a front that's very congested. Uh, you know, you have a, a war where you, you're, having, you're having millions of soldiers being deployed, not just hundreds of thousands. So this is a scale beyond Napoleon, the Civil War, Franco-Prussian War, anything else. And then you have so many forces packed into such a tight area overall. And, you know, World War I is not by its nature static. The war in Russia is certainly not static. But if I'm going to put that many men in there and... The technological advances were, uh, I mean, and the technological advance, technology had outstripped the tactics. Uh, they didn't have good communication systems. And they are having to do with the deal with that problem. At the same time, you're also dealing with an officer class that has a lot of backbiting. A lot of their military's experience is more in colonial warfare. So while that does give them some military experience, it's not going to be the same caliber as somebody would have fought like a more mass war. And I don't think the British had fought. A massive war since the Crimean War, which is not a war that they did that particularly well at either. Um, but anyway, so the uh, I mean there was, there was the Boer War, but that's the Boer War is just kind of like a really big colonial war. Yeah, um, it's funny too. You mentioned that because uh, actually two of the men who fought against the British in the Boer War would become theater commanders in World War One. Uh, hilarious. Uh, it's one of those, oh God, uh, Jan Smuts. Yeah, Smuts and also uh, Jacob Van Deventer. Okay. <clears throat> uh, but you definitely did have uh, incompetence in actually all the armies of World War I, especially the beginning, because of their tactical problems. And I do think with certain select commanders, like uh, uh, Douglas Haig or Conrad von Hotzendorf, there was, and you know, Luigi Cadorna, there was a um, a unique kind of stubborn stupidity to what they were doing. So, yes. you know, it's, it, it, I think the whole like butcher thing is a myth insofar as it doesn't apply to everyone and doesn't understand the situation. But certain officers do, the myth works. Yeah, it's also interesting because I read basically the, what was supposed to be the counter acting narrative against the British generals as butchers and cavalry officers only and that was by Robin Nylans who wrote uh, The Great War Generals on the Western Front 1914 and yeah. 18. It's a good book but one of his key arguments is that it wasn't just all cavalry officers who were in high command. But if you look at it, it actually was. <laughs> it really was. Um, if you think about the guys who were in charge of most of the major armies, uh, both on almost every front, and most of them had served in the mounted arm. And most of them were friends who had worked together. There was definitely a boys club. A very in, in general, the cavalry at this time was in the ascendant within the British Army. But still, uh, that sort of stereotype of the British generals who had, were former horsemen and living in chateaus, it's basically 100% accurate. Except Nylon's got mad and he said, all the people saying that are just class snobs because they don't understand that chateaus are useful as headquarters and they're just trying to look down on these men as being elitists who don't care about others and um but his argument in that case is pretty weak because they literally were guys who served in the cavalry and worked out of chateaus so uh that part fails but in general i think he does do a decent job of pointing out if you're going to call them a bunch of morons you have to find generals from other factions who did noticeably better and that's mm -hmm. where the narrative falls apart, the butcher narrative, I mean. Because I can't think of a group, any other group of World War I generals who are distinctly <laughs> superior to the British ones. I mean, I can think of some who are about on par, but that's not the same thing. And I can definitely think of some who are way worse. We just talked about a couple of them, uh, the Italians and the Ottomans. Especially the Ottomans. Especially the Ottomans, <laughs> and probably the Austrians too. I don't, I don't, I don't feel like there were too many good Austrian generals. Russia, a lot of them didn't get a chance. Uh, Germany, they had some good and bad generals. Um, France, they, 
I mean, when we get to them, I think that actually, in terms of generalship, arguably is the low point of any of these factions. Just because if you look at the, the resources they had and then what they did with them, I think they underperformed the most. Hmm. Maybe. I, I also think in terms of generalship in World War One, the French are the most extreme. Uh, because uh, some of the very best commanders are French. Yeah, but also they were trying actively to purge themselves of the people who were against the spirit of the offense. So had they had a few more years, they would have totally purged out people like Patan. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so the French army was actively making itself shittier because the offensive cult had taken full control and had, for a few years, been purging the officer corps. So, actually, if it had happened a little bit earlier, the French might have been better off. Just because that fucked up doctrine that cost so many lives was not yet uh, just really that well entrenched. But, anyway... Um, yeah, so that's basically the controversy is that a lot of people, especially people living in the Commonwealth, view the British generals as being uniquely inept and as being butchers who did not care about the lives of their men, especially their men from the colonies. And I think it's a little bit unfair, but I definitely see where they're coming from, especially because the British tended to be condescending when they were dealing with Commonwealth officers and basically accused them of being incompetent. Which is also mm -hmm. the attitude the British had toward the Americans when they arrived, and toward the Portuguese, and toward everyone else, pretty much. And then the French, <coughs> ironically, thought the British were incompetent, the British thought the French were incompetent. Um, a little bit of chauvinism going on. Yeah, I think that you kind of get that with a lot of factions in wars. Like, you get that in World War II as well, but I get the feeling it's much more extreme in this one. Definitely. Um... Yeah, it's also not that common that you have harmonious meetings between the French and British generals. There's usually a lot of yelling, and um, usually those meetings do not end all that well. But nice. anyway, um, we'll start out with Jan Smoots, who is someone who's, I think, in, in many ways, him being the East Africa commander is not even close to being the most significant thing that he did in his life. This is a man who ha led a, ver a varied and fascinating existence. Yeah. So, um, he later became a two-time prime minister. He was effectively a founding father of South Africa. As I mentioned, he's an Afrikaner or a Boer. He was born in 1870. And he was actually raised as a Dutch traditionalist, which means that he was from a pretty conservative religious family. And he also didn't fit in well in British society, but he still operated in that milieu. He attended Victoria College in South Africa, graduated young, and then went to Cambridge at 16 to study the law. And academically, he always did brilliantly, um, to the point where he uh, was usually first in his class, which might have also been somewhat more alienating. Um, he was not from a particularly wealthy family, so when he was at Cambridge, he actually borrowed money from a professor in order to stay afloat. Um, one thing he had going for him is that he was extremely good at learning things very quickly, and he was considered a polymath. And because of that, he actually is usually credited as the person who developed the philosophy of holism. So if you've ever heard of holistic thinking, one of the key figures in the formation of that line of thinking is actually Jan Smuts. And he would not publish this until 1926, but this was already something he believed in by the time that he became a theater commander in 1916. He went back to South Africa, he became a well-respected lawyer, and he also fought in the Second Boer War of 1899 to 1902, but he had a much different experience than most. Not only was he on the Boer side, but also he started out as a spy in Pretoria. And then later he joined the Boers in the field, and he became sort of like a maybe battalion level commander, and he really excelled at hit and run tactics. So even though his experience was limited and he didn't really have what we'd call high level command experience, what experience he did have was very positive. And it should come as no surprise, I mean, the guy's a quick learner. He's a very quick study. But actually, most of his significance in that war is as a negotiator. 
and he really helped to broker the peace between Britain and the Boers. And then later on, he also plays a huge role in figuring out how uh, Britain and the Boers will coexist. So in many ways, like I said, he is a founding father of South Africa. He was second to a man named uh, Louis Botha. And um, one thing about Smuts is that even though he does have this exalted status, he is not very popular politically. And in fact, at one point before World War I, when he was a cabinet member, he was sort of the boogeyman of the government, where people would blame him for problems. And there were a few threats against his life at this time. Actually, quite a few threats against his life. So he took part in a couple of small operations at the beginning of the war, including the occupation of German Southwest Africa, which I'm not going to go into because it was literally just uh, the British marched in, the German colonel there panicked and got outmaneuvered and surrendered. So there's not really much going on. And I think Britain lost less than 100 men total in the entire campaign. And we're talking about the occupation of a pretty large area. So this was a large, complex operation. And if I had to guess, most of the casualties would have come from disease or from uh, heat or something else. There weren't, a lot of, there weren't a lot of fights in this campaign. So South Africa became super overconfident because of this. Because they literally did the Caesar came, uh, I, I came, I saw, I conquered in Southwest Africa. So the South Africans, especially Botha and Smoots, started to behave arrogantly toward the British and they basically said, okay, if we're going to take part in East Africa, we're taking command because clearly you guys suck. And we're, we're pretty awesome though. And then also they said, if you want our troops, that's our condition. And Britain at this time is stretched very thin. I mean, as Sean mentioned, the Western Front is extremely demanding on manpower. So Britain relented and they allowed effectively a talented amateur in Jan Smuts to be the theater commander and to face off against a man who had already embarrassed a number of professional soldiers, that being Letal Vorbeck, who I think sort of has a bit of a cult following, uh, which is mostly deserved, I would say. I would say he's a little bit overrated by, his, by the people who actually know about him, and then he's massively underrated by the vast majority of people have no idea who he is. But anyway, he was the German commander in East Africa. He had been defying the British for a couple years. And now Smuts is going in to deal with him. And Smuts, as I said, is very intelligent, but he's not a professional soldier. And so he will basically be exposed as an amateur in East Africa. He will have a preponderance of force on his side, but it will not be enough to overcome what he's facing. Oh, and I, I forgot to mention, by the way, that the original choice for East Africa was the former Western Front Army commander, Smith Dorian, but he got ill, so Smuts took his place. So anyway, um, Smuts wanted to use all of his numbers to outmaneuver the German East Africans, and he was, he was on a, in a bit of a rush. Uh, because back home there was a lot of discontent. Now, I, I'm not going to go into the details of South African politics because I don't really know the, a lot of the specifics. But they've already basically established apartheid or some early version of it. So you have sort of a mixed uh, white ruling class, meaning Dutch and British, over a black majority. And so South Africa doesn't want... Most of their troops are sending in the field are white troops. They don't want them to get killed or defeated. Otherwise, they think that might spark a revolt. So Smuts is under the dueling pressures of winning quickly and also avoiding heavy losses. So to that end, he's trying to outmaneuver uh, Letal Vorbeck. And Letal Vorbeck does not have the firepower to simply blow through the British forces. And when I say British, I mean that in the loosest sense. In this case, the army, I think, in East Africa in early going was probably half or more South African. And then there were also troops from India and... A lot of native troops the British had raised, and also a lot of the Germans, quote-unquote, were actually local Africans who had been recruited. Uh, so, in Africa, the conditions are very harsh for warfare, especially for this period. Uh, there's not a lot of infrastructure, so most transportation, do you know how it's done, Sean? Most supply lines in this war? No, I do not. So, they don't have enough pack animals. So what they do is they have to draft locals 
usually through conscription, and have mm-hmm. them carry supplies and basically long lines of men who march hundreds of miles to carry ammo and food. Well, oh, kind of like the, yeah, porters. Like when you think of uh, African expeditions, like uh, Richard Francis Burton and stuff, right? Yes, uh, and so of course this incurs a lot of unpopularity. Both sides do it, and also the Belgians and Portuguese who help out. They also do this practice. Uh, so for every troop in the field, there are usually probably five porters, and this also means that the troops are perpetually undersupplied. Because if you think about it, if you got men carrying food, they're going to have to consume a lot of it to have enough calories to get to their destination. And also, the casualties among the porters are far worse than combat losses. And then the losses by disease are worse than combat losses as well. Uh, because, especially for the European troops, they're constantly ill. I want to say there was a stat that at any given time, one out of five of the European troops in East Africa, British and German, were incapacitated with malaria or some other disease. So, I mean, these guys are in and out of hospital constantly. Wow. Uh, It's pretty bad. And for the porters, if you look at the total casualties the British suffer in East Africa, it's 100,000 if you count all the porters. If you only count combat losses, it's only like 11,000. And a lot of the porters who died, by the way, died in fucking horrible ways because this is... You know, immensely difficult terrain. So a lot of them were killed by wild animals. Uh, some of them were eaten by crocodiles. Some of them were killed by lions. I mean, this this is incredible shit. We're talking about World War One, and yeah. there were casualties due to lions and crocodiles. It's mind blowing. So anyway, um, Smuts basically underestimated the difficulty of the task. He blamed his subordinates anytime something went wrong. Even though they tried to warn him, hey, I'm a professional soldier, I know I cannot march that fast on <clears> the <throat> terrain, Smut said, well, I'm a genius, so I know better. Yeah, you can. And then when they can't do it, after warning him they couldn't do it, he would fire them. Uh, because Smuts, I forgot to mention this, but he's a complete asshole. Uh, I mean, I guess that shouldn't be too surprising, given that this guy helped to set up an apartheid government, but um, on a personal level, Smuts is a pretty big asshole. <laughs> And um, so, for this reason, he does not get along well with a lot of his subordinates. Now, some of them he will get on with pretty well, but uh, there are others he simply does, he butts head with constantly. Uh, so, he's especially harsh on his British commanders, and it, he does not catch the Germans and all the traps he tries to set. Letal Vorbeck always escapes and usually inflicts casualties along the way. And... Basically, it's just a long game of cat and mouse where Smuts is always a step behind. I think he has a couple minor victories, and a lot of it is a race to try to seize some railheads. So he tried to make an unexpected move against one of the rail lines to cut off Smuts. That failed, and he got cut off himself from being able to do that. And he also tried to seize a port where Smut, where uh, Letal Vorbeck was getting his supplies, but the Germans managed to get a blockade runner through at literally the last minute and carry all the shit out right before the British got there. Um, so he was always just a step late. I mean, strategically, I think a lot of what he did made sense. There was nothing... I can't look at anything he did and call it stupid. But at the same time, I mean, he's just not a professional soldier, and he constantly underestimated the resourcefulness of Letal Vorbeck and his men. So he was always just a little bit lacking. But he did manage to liberate most of German East Africa by maneuver even though his force was shattered by the end of 1916, and that's when he was relieved. Because in theory, uh, the government in South Africa wanted to move him to London to be an advisor. So when he left, he basically declared victory, and this this enabled uh, Botha in South Africa to recall most of the troops from East Africa. They were South Africans. Mm-hmm. So this really fucks over the war effort, and the battle is far from won. Uh, so this will really put his successors in a bind we'll get into, Smuts then goes to London and he works to get his immediate replacement, the British General Hoskins, replaced with another South African, uh, Van de Venter. But anyway, um, if I had to, well, I'll, before I rate Smuts, I mean, do you have any thoughts on Smuts? <laughs> Not in particular. I've always heard of him more as the um, person with holistic thinking and um, uh, ideas on ecology as well, I believe. So, 
Yeah, I've heard his name quite a bit and didn't realize he was really involved in the military. Yeah, he's uh, um, pretty important. I think he's a field marshal. Actually, South Africa's only had two field marshals in its history. He's one of them. Yeah, I heard he was involved in the war, but I didn't know this much. Uh, in terms of uh, Letan Vorbeck, uh, very well regarded uh, commander, but I have read people being like, oh, he's either overrated or, he, or his reasons for success are not always entirely understood. But uh, that being said, he was mostly a successful commander in a situation that's pretty hard, right? Yes, he's very resourceful, and he also is able to rely on some very reliable subordinates. I mean, his subordinates never fuck up, really. And if he, they do, he replaces them with people who are will do what he says. And uh, he, he's very yeah. good at uh, so he's very good at operational maneuver. I think that much is clear. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I, I'm glad you mentioned the subordinate thing. I mean, you know, the more you study this stuff, the more you realize that uh, it, very few of these commanders had, like, you know, are successful at knucklehead subordinates. I mean, debatably Hannibal Barca, right? Yeah, but, I mean, it, I think there also are guys who can't fight independently, but they're just fine as long as they have detailed instructions right before they go out. That would be, of course, a number of Napoleon's generals, although I think the idea that Napoleon's generals were just, like, Bad independent command is overstated. Um, although, although there were a number who weren't that great for sure, especially towards the end of the Napoleonic Wars, when you got, when you know, guys like Macdonald and Udno are getting assignments that are beyond their mental capacity. Yeah, because I mean, just right offhand, I mean, Masina, Sul, and Davu did just fine on their own. Yeah, exactly. I'd also say Lan as well. Yeah, but um. Anyway, so <coughs> I think Latal Vorbeck. I mean, we're talking about his subordinates. A lot of them are actually only captains. Or majors, and I think Latal Vorbeck for a lot of this campaign was only a colonel, and then he gets promoted to maybe major general by the end. So, uh, yeah, he's actually not super high ranking. Oh, uh, fun fact: speaking of smuts and Latal Vorbeck, they actually didn't meet until 1950, when they were both in London, and apparently they became fast friends. Huh. And I think I think. Uh, Smuts died first in the mid '50s, and I want to say Latal Vorbeck traveled to his funeral. Wow! So yeah, it's it's interesting because um, I, I don't know. I, I'd like to know more about that, but apparently, it's Latal Vorbeck also had a difficult streak. So, and you know, he's obviously very intelligent and had a lot of interest in Africa. Uh, so anyway, I, I'd be curious what the nature of their friendship was, but anyway, um, so. For, for Smuts as a general, I'm thinking he's about an enemy. <clears throat> and a lot of that, I would I would give him a D, except I have to knock him down for doing some damage after he left command by declaring victory to try to glorify himself, and then uh, creating problems for his immediate successor and getting the guy relieved for no reason. What do you think? Seems fine to me, man. All right. Yeah, but in terms of IQ, I think we just got through the highest one that we'll do today. <laughs> and uh, he might he might be, in terms of pure intelligence, he's got to be very close to the smartest of the World War I generals. Um, wow, impressive. I mean, yeah, this guy is an actual genius. I mean, no doubt, he just wasn't a military genius. Yeah, that much is clear. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, although, I mean, comparatively, if you think about it, I mean, for the most part, if you're somebody with very limited military experience, you become a theater commander, things could have gone a hell of a lot worse. But, yeah. All right, so next up was his immediate replacement, Major, Reg Major General Reginald Hoskins. As I said, in East Africa, and this applies to the British as well, you could be a theater commander without being all that senior because the number of men involved was much, much smaller than on, say, the Western Front. So, Hoskins actually had a lot of experience in East Africa prior to the war. He was a graduate of Staff College, and he was deployed to West, the Western Front when the war broke out. So, in 1914-15, he's on the Western Front. He is first an adjutant for a division, and then he has his own brigade. Later in 1916, he was transferred back to East Africa, where he took up command of the 1st East Africa Division, which was effectively the main body of Smuts's force. And in that role, um, Hoskins did pretty well. 
Uh, so while a lot of the flank commanders that Smuts had and his uh, South African mounted infantry units didn't do super well, the troops under the command of Hoskins always won their fights and got where they needed to be on time. So Hoskins was pretty well proven, at least at that level he was at. So he was now the theater commander after Smuts went to London. Well, as I mentioned, when Smuts left, not only did a lot of the South African troops go home, but also a lot of the troops were exhausted. They had extended beyond their supply lines. So they were short on porters, they were short on supplies, a lot of the men were ill, and they did not have the ability to keep following up and trying to finish off Letal Vorbeck. So he took a pause starting in January of 1917. And then in April, London was getting pissed off because he hadn't moved yet. But again, if you think about it, uh, these kind of pauses are not uncommon in warfare. Even when you have motorized transportation, say on the Eastern Front, it usually took a few months between offensives, right? And that's with much, much more motorized transportation and railroads. So Hoskins is doing this literally with lines of guys carrying boxes. And when he's asked, well, what the hell are you doing? Why are you sitting on your hands? He said, I need two more months, then I will go straight into what remains of Germany, East Africa, finish this thing up. And basically, the, the judgment at the war office was, oh, this guy's shot his bolt. He's lost his confidence. And the leading guy saying this was Smuts, who is now in London. Smuts said, look, I knew Hoskins. He's a good man, but uh, we, he used, he's done for. He's lost his confidence. He exhausted himself. He's got nothing left. We need to relieve him. And um, I think if we put a South African command, we might get more troops from South Africa. But while he was in command, what Hoskins did do, I think, is somewhat impressive because he actually does manage to find other troops for his armies to replace the lost South Africans. And he mostly relies upon troops in Africa, so a lot of the native units that the British are raising up. And he does the hard work of calling up more porters because that's obviously immensely unpopular, and somebody had to do it. Hoskins did it. So when he is replaced by Van de Venter, Hoskins has left him in a position to go immediately on the offensive. Although, as we'll discuss, Van de Venter should have waited just a little bit longer. But anyway, uh, Hoskins gets relieved because, supposedly for being inactive, but I think it's pretty unfair. And I don't know how much better he would have done than Van de Venter if he had stayed in command, but at least he wanted to make sure he was prepared before he went in. So I feel like he probably would have done a little better. But as we'll see, one of the difficulties that faced Van Deventer was something that was very uh, required a gentle touch. So actually, as we'll see, it's possible if Smuts was still there, he might have actually been able to show his skills. But anyway, uh, for now we got to rate Hoskins. Uh, do you have any thoughts on? Oh wait, uh, last thing on Hoskins. After he left this area, he went to Mesopotamia, commanded a division, retired in 1923 and then became a hardcore member of the Conservative Party, and he spent the last hmm. 20 years of his life uh, training young activists. But anyway, what do you think about Hoskins? Uh, it kind of sounds like maybe a C to me. That's what I'm thinking, too. Yeah. <clears throat> it sounds like he also, of course, got railroaded by, uh, by Smuts there. Yeah, but that so shouldn't really Smuts set him up for to take, take a ride, and the only way he could have avoided that would be to use those shattered army to try to keep pressing offensives, which would have been stupid. All right, uh, next up we have Jacob Van Deventer. He's another Boer veteran of the Boer Wars, and he, there's not that many pictures of him, but apparently he's a very imposing person. He was unusually tall, probably about six foot six or so, and he was also very good at guerrilla war. So while Smuts had a lot more experience as a spy and negotiator, Van de Venter was in the field during the Boer War kicking ass the whole time. He, he was also in Southwest Africa, just like a lot of the other South African officers, and later he was one of the guys commanding a mounted infantry brigade and later a division in East Africa. As I mentioned, those flanking forces that, that uh, Smuts employed typically didn't do that well. So, as a subordinate commander, Van Deventer was definitely not as good as Hoskins. 
but part of that is because he had a harder task, to be fair. Um, and also his troops, the South African uh, mounted troops, were probably the weakest of the Commonwealth mounted troops overall. So, let I me mean, keep that in mind. It's not necessarily a mark against Van Deventer himself. But of course, because he's a fellow South African, Smuts talked about him in glowing terms, at least after he had left and he was looking for a new commander-in-chief. He said, oh yeah, Van Deventer, now that's your guy right there. Um, he will do a fantastic job. And I'll be able to convince Botha to send back some men to East Africa if you put him back in charge. So I guess one thing you can say for Van Deventer is that him getting back in charge meant that South Africa sent more men and supplies, which were badly needed. So in the spring of 1917, um, he took command of the British forces, and the problem is that, or one of the problems that he has, he has a very limited command of English, apparently. So as you can imagine, that will be a problem since he has to work with British officers and officers from India who speak English and things like that. But it doesn't seem to have been a crippling problem. So either he improved his English or he had staff around him, or his English actually wasn't that terrible. He might have just had a strong accent or something like that. Anyway, um, he took command in the spring of 1917. And he pressed into action early. Probably a couple months earlier than he should have. And the result is that basically he keeps up what Smuts had been doing of trying to outmaneuver and trap Letal Vorbeck. He actually does it a little bit better. He has a little bit more of a killer instinct to him. But uh, And eventually he does take all of German East Africa by about the end of 1917. But once again, uh, Letal Vorbeck always manages to escape at the last minute, always manages to find more supplies at key moments and keep going. And by the end of 1917, this is where Letal Vorbeck was in, potentially in deep trouble. Because he's, he's trapped in a corner, he doesn't have a lot of land behind him. And, of course, Van de Venter has him outnumbered, even if his troops are, are pretty tired. So, at that point, Letal Vorbeck actually invades Portuguese East Africa. And now you have a bit of a diplomatic crisis, because Portugal not only has internal problems out the wazoo, but they're also pissed off about their troops being sent to the Western Front and slaughtered due to the treaty between the British and the Portuguese. So, effectively, Van de Venter is given instructions not to uh, forcibly intervene. So he has to ask permission from a general, or I guess technically a colonel in Portuguese East Africa named Sousa Rosa. And he has to ask him for permission to join him. But Sousa Rosa says, the Germans don't outnumber us, we'll beat them ourselves. Portuguese pride all the way. And uh, <laughs> guess what? They don't. They... they fucking fail horribly and they fail horribly enough that this prolongs the war in East Africa because Letal Vorbeck is able to capture a lot of Portuguese East Africa including a lot of weapons so basically his men their rifles are worn out they replace them with the Portuguese rifles so later on when they surrender in 1919 um, most of the rifles that his men have are ones they captured in, from the Portuguese so eventually after De Sousa Rosa kept getting his ass kicked for a while. He does eventually request aid, so Van de Venter comes. But by the time he comes, then Letal Vorbeck escapes back into German East Africa. Because remember, these are huge areas without a lot of infrastructure, and these are small armies, so it's easy to slip in and out of places. And cornering an enemy army when they're this small, when they're less than 10,000 men total and they don't always march together, is actually a pretty Herculean task. And uh, to, to be fair to Van de Venter, um, I don't see what else he could have done to help the Portuguese. Because they refused his aid, and he was under strict instructions from London not to press the issue. Because uh, the British didn't want to lose Portugal as an ally. And, I mean, as, as interesting as East Africa is, it's, it's clearly not the most important theater. So, the British government would weigh it as, yeah, we'd rather lose in East Africa than lose the support of Portugal and whatever the core or whatever it is they're keeping on the Western Front. Um, yeah, we'll talk about the Sousa Rosa again when we do the minor powers because I think he's he's got to be in the running for one of the absolute worst generals of the war just because of what he did in East Africa. Um, oh, definitely. 
Yeah, he, he fucking blew it multiple times. Um, so anyway, Van Deventer eventually does corner Latal Vorbeck. Uh, the last attempt to, to give him supplies was like some harebrained Zeppelin scheme where the Germans were going to send Zeppelins to give him more supplies, but they couldn't make it. And uh, actually what defeats Latal Vorbeck is not Van Deventer, although he probably would have eventually just because he's got a larger army. But what really defeats Latal Vorbeck is the fact that Germany loses the war in Europe. And once the armistice is announced, that's when Latal Vorbeck's army starts to desert in mass. I mean, they're already hungry and struggling for supplies, but when that news arrives from Europe that the armistice has been called, his men just start deserting in large numbers. And I suspect the British are the ones who spread that news, because it gets there really fast. Um, I think that the armistice is November 1st, and Latal Vorbeck's men start deserting on the 3rd or 4th. So, uh, yeah, Van Deventer technically did win the war, at least in East Africa. Um, he went home to South Africa. I imagine he's a war hero, so things are going pretty well for him. He puts down a white labor revolt, and he also got married. But then he died in 1922. So he did not really get to enjoy the glory that he won in East Africa. And I put glory in scare quotes here. <laughs> um, so what do you think of uh, Jacob, or as he's known to his friends, Jop Van Deventer? Uh, I mean, it seems to me like you're saying that, of course, he was successful. But at that point, just the preponderance of um, material in his favor. And uh, Latan Vorbeck was really starting to hit the end of his tether anyway. Yeah, um, I, I think that's fair, and I think he actually is probably a slight upgrade on Smuts overall, just because he's more, I think he's got a little bit more combat experience and a little bit more military sense, but you could see yeah. some of his weaknesses exposed when he has to deal with the Portuguese, and I don't think he offended them to his credit, so apparently he's not a terrible um, diplomat, but I feel like Smuts might have been a little bit better prepared for that. Because you know he's a professional lawyer among other things, so he's pretty good at arguments, and possibly mm -hmm. good at persuasion. Um, I mean, personally, I feel like Van Deventer's probably a D. Yeah, sure, that sounds good to me. Yeah. And again, uh, despite the fact that apparently he's a very interesting person and very interesting looking because he's so big, uh, there aren't a lot of pictures of the guy. Okay. So, now we get to, I guess, the big boys on the main front. I figured we had a... Uh, because I feel like, in many ways, the East Africa campaign was kind of the last colonial war Britain fought. And it was a lot more similar to what they had been doing prior to World War One. So I figured that, that's one reason to cover that first. Well, I mean, when you say colonial war, I mean, well, you're not thinking of... You're not thinking of anything like Singapore or uh, the Malaysian uh, oh, crisis? Oh, yeah, I guess that's true. I didn't think of that, but yeah, you're right. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I mean, I mean, it might be the last colonial war in like the in the sense of that Victorian era. I mean, I know, I know, we're not in the Victorian era, but you get what I'm saying, right? Like yeah. that whole like you know, it has like a, a it, it, it it feels like a throwback to the Victorian era because by the time we get into Singapore, the British are just trying to hold the line against a superior opponent. Yeah, although it's interesting in this case because uh, in East Africa it does seem a lot more like a campaign that would take place in 1895 because, I mean, it's a big deal if your army has eight machine guns. Yeah, exactly. I think that's what you mean. It's more like that, yeah. you know. That kind of colonial war. <laughs> yeah, um, and also I, I think they did try at one point to send motorized vehicles to help with logistics, but they sent the wrong kind. So they ended up just sitting there collecting rust. And, I mean, also it's worth mentioning, cars at this period, of course, were not what they are now. And the roads in East Africa were total shit. So there weren't going to be that many vehicles that would have been that useful for convoys. Yeah. All right. Now we move on to leadership at the tippity-top. Prime Minister Herbert... Henry Asquith, but he usually went by H.H. What do you think about uh, 
Mr. Asquith and his government and his war policy, Sean? Uh, I don't claim to be an uh, expert on Asquith or particularly uh, well read on him, which sort of makes sense. I always feel like I always feel like he's this he's this major political figure, but uh, people in this era are usually talking about what you know, like Churchill and Lloyd George. Yeah, you know. Even though Asquith, I mean, he was prime minister for eight years. I mean, that's like Thatcher level stuff. <clears throat> right. <clears throat> um, he's the last of the liberal prime ministers to actually have a majority government. So his name is usually associated with the decline of the Liberal Party, which is discussion all on its own. Uh, there's that fun book, which I haven't read, but I've heard about it. You ever heard of it? It's called uh, The Strange Death of Liberal England. I have heard of the book, but I have not read it. Yeah, it, it, it's apparently saying that why did the Liberal Party at the essentially at the height of their power uh, was dying out very quickly, and one of the arguments is that essentially they got undercut by the Labour Party. And a lot of the party's ideas and ideals were um, did not really have working class appeal while middle and upper class people started to go more Tory to begin with. You know, uh, you know but so... I think the demise of the Liberal Party is one I'd like to read more about. Uh, you know, I, I mean, like I mean, it it doesn't seem like the, what it, what it is with the Whig Party though, because the the Whig Party in America got destroyed because its leadership was died, and the party was was breaking over uh, questions of slavery and immigration and alcohol, and um, the Whigs had been seen to have made too many deals with the Democrats. Uh, that is not the case, Liberal Party. You know, the the Whigs died when they were out of power. The the, the Liberals die when they're in power. Uh, Asquith is generally considered to be a successful peacetime prime minister. It is ultimately his call to go into the war, which is. Do you think Britain going into World War One is considered controversial? Um, at the time. Maybe a little bit at first, but then I think Britain was swept by, by war fever, just like everywhere else. No, no, but I mean, like, in retrospect. Um, that's a good question. I don't know exactly. I mean, I feel like there was more reluctance to get involved in continental affairs at the time. Especially, <laughs> well, if, especially if Russia is one of the people you're you know, going to bat for. Yeah. Well, in, in the case of Asquith... I mean, in the case of Britain, Britain finds itself in this real bind. British policy had long been to... Uh, British policy, I would say, starting in the 1700s. Because in the 1600s, England is a backwater kingdom. You know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's considered a minor kingdom. Uh, the French and the Dutch had the superior navies at the time. And, you know, a variety of things happened to where by the time you get to the mid-1700s... Uh, Britain is one of your premier powers, and then is definitely the world power after Waterloo. Although the British were always very conscious of their limits and how fragile their position was. I mean, not everybody, of course, but you know, they, they, more than more than other powers, definitely more than America. I would say they're very cognizant of these are our limits, and. British policy throughout the 17 and 1800s was whoever is the most powerful country in the continent we're opposed to. We will get other countries to fight them for us. And we do that through financial support because we have a superior banking system. And then, of course, you have the Industrial Revolution. At the same time, of course, Britannia rules the waves. I mean, by the time you get to the... Um, I'd say that the British Navy is truly dominant starting with the Seven Years' War. And we'll, be, and we'll continue to be dominant until World War II. I mean, they're on the rise for the Seven Years' War, but it's really the Seven Years' War where it's... You're, you're, I mean, well, Britannia rules the waves. That, that song came out during the uh, War Jenkins' Ear, but uh, the War of the Austrian Succession wasn't necessarily the Royal Navy's finest hour, but definitely the Seven Years' War, very good. But anyway, so... <clears throat> you the dominant Navy in the world, particularly after Trafalgar. Um, you have a small but elite army. You really start seeing that... You could actually say that one almost goes back to Cromwell, but definitely uh, the continuity would, would start with Marlborough, and it's 
and, and, and then since then. Now, I say small but elite. Of course, the British Army had its share of defeats and a number of wars. They didn't do very well. They didn't do that great in the War of the Austrian Succession. They didn't do all that well in the Crimean War. Uh, you know, and they had they had a number of embarrassing uh, colonial defeats, such as Afghanistan. Um, I got, I'm probably butchering the name. You know, you know about Majaba Hill. No. Yes, yeah, the first time the Brits fought the Boers and they lost horribly. It caused a major, um, uh, ba- it caused a lot of repercussions in uh, in England at the time. Hmm. You know, I, I I must be. I got to find the name of this hill. You know, I I'm, tr- I'm sorry I'm drawing a roll blank on this. Maybe somebody in the chat will, will know what I'm talking about. Probably so. Um, but no. So anyway. Um, so the uh, the British policy had always been that. You get into the First World War, though, they find themselves being dragged into a war where they're going to probably have to commit major forces. Now, at first, they only committed the BEF. And the BEF did well, but that's not enough of them. And you know, the war, by 1915, they know the war is definitely going to go be going on for a while, right? Right. The decision has to be made that we need to raise a mass army, which at first is volunteer, a lot of people do volunteer, and then eventually conscription. Very haltingly. You can tell he doesn't really, his heart's not quite into it. He was starting to have problems with alcoholism. And especially over Gallipoli, his party took a major hit from that, and he had to be, in, he had to be head of a coalition government. So even though Asquith oversaw the essential policies that Britain enacted in the war and used uh, and, and, and held until the end, Lloyd George was really the one who gave the British war effort um, more drive and focus. One thing that Lloyd George in particular did was not always deferring to the generals. And, yeah, I just don't think Asquith, even though he was the man who guided Britain into war, his heart was not quite into it. And the Liberal Party, uh, what it appears to me in is that a lot of their fissures really opened up during the war. I mean, what's interesting, too, is that, you know, the fall of the, the Russian government was 1917, and that caused a mass crisis. The fall of the Asquith government uh, does not have a mass crisis happen. You know, it, I've always said that one of the, one of the um, main takeaways of the First World War is that it broke the power of monarchies, monarchies that in many ways had been uh, reinvigorated after the Napoleonic Wars. And the democratic governments, France, Britain, survived and much more durable than the uh, the monarchical ones. Uh, so I've always thought, like, you know, the reason we even have, like, liberal democracy is because I'm like, oh, well, it won both the world wars, you know, and then the Cold War. It's, it's autocratic challengers were defeated. Um, anyways... I mentioned the question about Britain getting involved in the war because there are a lot of people who feel that this was a horrible idea. Uh, that that the, the the flower of Britain of British youth was annihilated on the Western Front, and along with it, Victorian and Edwardian ideals uh, that Britain has never recovered from. Um, you know, the mass slaughter of the Western Front, and which seemed even more invalid when they had to go fight World War II because, you know, they... So, you know... It's a controversial thing, but it was inevitable, I think. You know, I mean, besides the fact that it was British policy to oppose whoever was the strongest country in the continent that happened to be Germany, it's also long been British policy to make sure that no great power controls Flanders. Flanders being the easiest way for the British, easiest area for the British to get their goods into the market, and of course being the best position from which to invade Britain as well. Yep. Um, and a so, long-standing ally too, with a lot of cultural links. Um, especially, I mean, because I, I just did the video recently on the Protestant Reformation. And I think that's really when the links between Britain and the Netherlands became much stronger. And also that's where the Calvinist influence came to Britain, was through the Netherlands. Yeah, and the Dutch helped to defeat the Spanish Armada, played a large part in that. Uh, 
I mean, there were, there was some tension there. There was the uh, the raid on the Medway, where um, the Dutch Navy came in and just burned the British fleet, including their flagship. Right. Um, you know, but and then I mean, the Netherlands is the last country to invade Britain and win, or even the last country to invade Britain with the Glorious Revolution. I mean, it's an invasion, an army lands, a hostile army. Yeah, I guess that's true. Uh, it technically is. Yeah, no, no. This, <laughs> yeah, this whole, like, this, people are like, Britain hasn't been invaded since 1066. And, like, they've invaded several times since then, and one of those times was really successful. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, like, you know, Parliament invited the, the Dutch king, uh, William, the, the future William III, to... Um, and yeah, the Dutch they invited William to invade England. Uh, Parliament are traitors to the Stuarts. But you know, treason doth never prosper. And what's the reason? Because if it prosper, none dare call it treason. But if somehow James the Second had defeated William, uh, then we'd be just then we'd be talking about a lot of parliamentary guys who got their heads chopped off. Yeah. Well, also, I mean, I think too the idea of national allegiance was much much weaker before the rise of nationalism in the nineteenth century. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there's some people who think that's not the case, or that maybe that's overstated, but I do think that, I do think that uh, the idea, I, th I, the, I think what you have is a greater, atten I think that 19th century nationalism is a much more centralized nationalism, for one thing. You know, so, a person could have an idea of, I'm a Frenchman, I should fight for France, or whatever with France, but it would also have a lot of pull to their locality as well. Yeah, you know, and and when it comes to like the Middle Ages, that's when I really start going like I don't know about nationalism then, but that's something I don't feel um, that I would know enough about. But yeah, because you do have um, national monarchies that emerge that try to push the idea, but it does take some time to really take hold. I mean, it doesn't look like most peasants cared that much which king they were under, unless that king was known for being particularly good or bad. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, peasants, peasants. Yeah, exactly. Peasants will only care insofar as how good or incompetent is the man. Uh, I think there's some seeds of nationalism with Louis the Fourteenth, both with his centralization project, but also the fact that Louis the Fourteenth actually made a national appeal during the War of the Spanish Succession to the people of France to redouble their efforts to win the war. Uh, that's a major event in uh, in French history. Yeah, I mean, and also without if if there had been medieval French nationalism, there's absolutely no way there would have ever been a Plantagenet Empire. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I think with I think you get in the Middle Ages. I mean, besides the fact the countries are so the kingdoms are so small as well, I don't think you really quite have that. Uh, but I do think you know you get into the 1700s, you can especially see an emerging national identity in Britain and Russia where they think of themselves as different than the rest of Europe and in very strong ways, you know? And, um, but anyway, so I think that it, it's, as Quiff getting involved is, um, is controversial for a lot of people. And even if one believes at the First World War that Britain had to get involved, and I think there's, you can make a good case for that. Uh, the Kaiser's Germany is... Only looks good to us just because the Nazis are worse. But the Kaiser's Germany is a pretty ruthless country, you know. Um, and I'm, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm not sure it'd been like I'm not sure a German victory in World War One had been some like grand, great event for the humanity. But who knows? Um, but Britain had its interests. But I think uh, it's under Asquith that you see Britain deploying a massive army. The, I believe the largest army Britain will ever field. Bigger than World War II. Uh, they lose more men in World War I than World War II. World War II is important to the uh, British memory, no doubt, but I think World War I looms, looms larger. I'm inclined to agree. Um... And a lot, of, a lot of it too. I think World War One was more painful for the British because not only did they look pretty <coughs> weak in front of the Commonwealth powers, but also they were, in many ways, they felt forced to do France's bidding because effectively they were taking orders on the Western Front from the French, for all practical intents and purposes. 
Yeah, and the, well, the French, of course, also have the larger army. I think another thing that happens, too, with World War One is you really have the British calling in colonial troops from everywhere to be brought to Europe. You know, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, India. Um, and, uh, you know, that, 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 that also caused a lot, of fr- a lot of problems to the British Empire afterwards because uh, they make promises to the Indians that they break it. Uh, and for many, that really is the beginning of the end for the, for the British in India. Yeah, um, that but, yeah. and um, also they had to, even as Britain was becoming exhausted, they had to take on more and more of the Western Front as time progressed. You know, as they got their industrial capacity up and they were able to arm more men, because by this point, France, with its brilliant strategy, had really depleted its own manpower pool. So the British front just kept getting longer and longer. What do you think of the idea that you're a declining power when you become a debtor country? I don't know about that. I think that's an oversimplification. Um, I mean, early on in American history, the U.S. was a debtor country. Yeah, but we weren't like a great power. I'm talking about, you know, like, like Britain to keep themselves in World War I has to borrow from the Americans. You know? Um, I mean, I feel like every country had to borrow for the war except for the U.S. Um, but the, I, what I'm saying is that the British, the, I mean, the British ran up massive debts for the Napoleonic Wars. But that's, th- those debts were so they could give money to countries that were much less economically strong, like Austria. Right. Um, good question. I, I mean, don't know. Brit- I don't... I mean, Britain's, Britain's economic power was already waning in comparison with Germany and America. But World War I also breaks them in that regard. Yeah. Um, it definitely hurt Britain and France, although they clearly did survive. Um and uh, yeah, like you said, Britain's hold on the colonies was pretty weakened. And I think also part of the reason why there is that strong negative tradition about the British generals is because at this time, the yearning for independence and a fuller separation is really starting to emerge in places like Australia and New Zealand. Because most of the books written about Gallipoli are by pissed off Australians and New Zealanders. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't think that's, that's a coincidence. <laughs> that's big in australia by the way um you know like there's the train station um some of the train stations in uh sydney um they just have names of the dead in there and things you know yeah i mean uh, i think the the book by john laffin which i think has been published under a couple different names damned dardanelles and some other things i feel like that is effectively the commonwealth official narrative of that campaign. Hmm. Uh, so I would rate Asquith a, uh, a C uh, because essentially the policies the British used are the ones he implemented. But um, at the same time, he did not provide the strong inspirational leadership and by the end of it, he's pretty much one of the most despised I don't know about despise. Just one of the most disliked people in Britain, mm-hmm. and some of that. I mean, to a degree, I think it's a bit unfair too. I think the the horrible losses in the Somme and Gallipoli were being blamed on him, which I mean, you're the guy in charge. You're going to take the hit anyway, usually, right? You know. But uh, but yeah, but overall, like the framework that Britain will pursue strategically and their actual domestic policies, there it's all simply as Quith implements almost all of it. Uh, Lloyd George would just continue it, you know. Yeah, I feel like the, by the time Lloyd George takes over, the war effort is actually in full gear, finally. Or it's yeah. approaching it, at <clears throat> least. Um, so, Lloyd George is an interesting figure. Um, he is a Welsh politician, and probably the last formidable liberal leader that Britain ever produced, unless you count Nick Clegg, which I don't think anybody would. <laughs> no, um, Nick Clegg. Yeah. Um, so anyway, Lloyd George was someone who was within the same party as Asquith, but was also a staunch critic of Asquith's handling of the war, and also the way the generals performed, and his critique came down to something that was pretty understandable and relatable for a lot of people in Britain, 
and that was the casualty figures. Lloyd George assumed that there's no way you're producing these kind of casualty figures unless you're doing something very, very wrong. And because of this, he comes into contact, a conflict with Haig and the others throughout the war years. In fact, there are many times where he's trying to look for a reason to get rid of Haig, but he never quite finds anybody that he can replace him with. So they don't ever really get along that well, but I guess they coexist. Um, Lloyd George from 1908 to 1915 was the Chancellor of the Exchequer and he became pretty popular in this position because in 1909 he passed what was called the People's Budget which increased taxes on the wealthy to fund new social programs and also to build more ships and he also fought for two years with the House of Lords and basically crushed them on this issue and the way he was able to do this is because he was a very good public speaker and in 1911, he won his battle with the House of Lords, and they were stripped of most of their actual powers. So it was Lloyd George who neutered the House of Lords, more so than any other figure in British politics. So at this point, they're basically just there to confirm things, and it's kind of honorary, but before that point, they had actual power. I think they technically do still have some power, but it's not, you know, that much. Um... He also was a big pusher of liberal reform, and he helped to enact pensions for the elderly and disabled. And he became so synonymous with, I guess, what you might think of as a dole, that people, rather than saying, I'm going on the dole or going on public assistance, for a, a couple generations, people said, I'm going on the Lloyd George. So you can imagine if you're the guy who broke the House of Lords and created new social programs that help people in a measurable way, you're basically a living legend, and you have a lot of pull with the population as a whole. When the war, yeah, yeah, go ahead. No, just yes, uh, and a lot of that was also done uh, with uh, Asquith as well, overseeing things. But uh, but yeah, no, that this is why Lloyd George. I mean, if you ask somebody like if somebody, somebody's like you know reasonably well informed, like name me a British Prime Minister uh, pre Churchill, who are they going to say? Probably Lloyd George. Unless they want to go back to like Horace Walpole or something like that. Gladstone, maybe? Yeah. Disraeli, Lloyd George, those are the three that I would I would tend to hear. Yeah. yeah. Not gonna not gonna say Liverpool. <laughs> yeah. You could say Duke of Wellington though. He was, I think, Prime Minister for what, a year? A few yes, he was Prime Minister for a few years, oversaw Irish I'm saying Irish Catholic emancipation. Um, I believe the person was Prime Minister longest, though, although I don't even know if they had the exact term back then. There was also William Pitt, both the, uh, William Pitt the Younger was a big one, but also, um, I think the longest Prime Minister is Lord North, the one during the American Revolution. I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, Lloyd George, even though it, technically this was all on Ask With Watch, uh, Lloyd George got a lot of the credit for it because he was the public face. He's the guy out there on the stump and he's a pretty accomplished order so he's getting a lot of the credit and he's also kind of the token Welshman I guess so he he stands out for that reason because well the Welsh have a pretty distinctive accent and so if you hear his voice come over a radio broadcast or you hear a public address well guess what you're gonna know it's him immediately now, when the war first broke out, Lloyd George was a pretty staunch advocate of keeping Britain out of it. But once the Germans invaded Belgium, Lloyd George was one of the people who was really into Belgian neutrality. Neutrality. That was a stance that a lot of British politicians apparently were very serious about. Um, so, once the Germans crossed the Belgian border, Lloyd George turned on a dime and became one of the strongest voices in favor of intervention and actually managed to persuade many people in the party who wanted to stay out of it that defending the sovereignty of small neutral nations was critical. So he actually is a huge factor in rallying the Liberal Party to get behind the war. He continued to be the head of the Exchequer until the end of 1914, and of course he had to watch his revenue fell off the cliff because of the lack of trade. Um, he tried to pass a tax increase, but that didn't happen, so he had to set Britain up to borrow a bunch of money. So he's the guy who basically signed the loan papers for the war. 
And then he left the Exchequer in April 1915, and he tried to become, and succeeded at becoming, the Minister of Munitions in May. And the reason for this is because the British were horribly short of artillery shells and things of that nature. They also were really lacking barbed wire early on. So the early BEF, they were really well trained in infantry tactics and especially fire and move, but they were under equipped with artillery, entrenching tools, and barbed wire, which the Germans had in much greater quantities. Um, so Lloyd George wanted to be the guy to correct this problem. And because of this, uh, the British were willing to look for a huge figure to take this job, which is normally not terribly sexy, Ministry of Munitions. But they want a strong person in that office to make sure it gets done. And um, so Lloyd George, the first problem he had to overcome, and it's amazing this was still a problem this late into the war, but effectively there were a lot of regulations about not having shifts at night. So these were pro-labor regulations, obviously. But they hadn't been re relaxed in any way to deal with the war. So Lloyd George was the guy who had to go and deal with that. And so he managed to figure that out. It was a pretty thorny issue. He got through it. And um, another problem he had to deal with was the lack of reliable fuses. Because British artillery shells, probably at one point, one in five of them didn't actually explode when they landed. So Lloyd George basically went around harassing people and making them improve the quality and quantity of artillery shells. Uh, there are people who think that his impact had been, has been overstated and that Britain was already on track to correct this problem. But Lloyd George did visit a lot of places and, um, you know, shake a lot of hands and make a lot of speeches. And as the problem did improve, whether he deserves credit or not, he definitely got the credit. And his popularity went up even more. And you might think Minister of Munitions, that's not a very high office, but despite that, Lloyd George already had massive influence on what the party was thinking and what the country was thinking. And another thing he managed to get his party to do, because Asquith wasn't quite up to the task, Lloyd George was the guy who went around and got the party behind the idea of universal inscription, or excuse me, conscription, which does not happen until late 1915. He also pushed for an intervention in the Balkans to try to save Serbia, but the generals were pretty pissed about that. The Salonika expedition does eventually happen, and a lot of that is due to Lloyd George pushing for it, but it happened later, and it was smaller in scope than he had envisioned. He also wanted in early 1916 to send machine guns to the Romanians, but General Robertson shot that down because the British also were outgunned on the Western Front. And he did visit the Western Front as Minister of Munitions, and there he saw that 20% of the shells or so were defective. And because he'd been in charge of munitions for a while, he said, um, no, you guys are wrong about that. I'm in charge of munitions. I know it's being done properly. It's just that British artillery men are incompetent. And of course, because of this, he butts head with, with a lot of the generals. And hes I don't think he's ever very popular with the officers, by the way. Um, also, it's interesting, uh, apparently the British artillery of all the arms of the British Army probably did the best on the Western Front. Yes, and it should also be noted that, no, he is not popular with the, uh, with the uh, generals. But, I mean, who do you, do you really want a guy who says, not only you're not doing your job right, but I can, like, direct it better than you? Or insinuating it, at least? Yeah, I mean, so he, he's pretty popular with the troops in the trenches, but not their officers. Um, they, especially Haig, it does not like him. And I mean, to be fair to Haig, I mean, Lloyd George is angling to get him removed. Um, so, early 1916, the Asquith government is not doing that well. Lloyd George refuses to resign, though, from his position. Uh, which is something people are asking him to do because they think if he resigns, Asquith falls, and then they can move on. Um... And he would have personally benefited from that because a lot of people who were urging him to resign so that way the Asquith government would fall, they were saying, and then we'll try to get you to pr be prime minister. So he did prove loyal to Asquith at a key moment. What ends up causing the fall of the government is that Kitchener dies. We'll talk about Kitchener 
later on. So, um, at this point, uh, Lloyd George actually takes Kitchener's place as Secretary of War. Or, I guess in British terms, it's technically Secretary of State for War. And the reason he got the position is not because he had the military experience of Kitchener, but rather just because he had the name recognition. Mm-hmm. By this point, um, the chief of staff of the army was Robertson, and he could communicate directly with the PM. And this meant that Lloyd George, as Secretary of State for War, no longer had any influence, at least on war policy. And part of that had been a way to try to circumvent Kitchener. Uh and it carried over to Lloyd George's tenure, so he no longer had any real role to play. And uh, he does have to interact more with officers now, so he's already butted heads some. Lloyd George, the man of words, was very big on someone's ability to express themselves eloquently. So if you were poorly spoken or you spoke in clipped sentences or something like that, Lloyd George would assume that you're an idiot and wouldn't take you seriously. Whereas if you can articulate really well, he'll think, oh, that guy knows what he's talking about. And this is a problem because a lot of these soldiers are pretty terse. Uh, Douglas Haig, for instance, is notoriously kind of terse. Whereas, by contrast, Ian Hamilton, the head of the Gallipoli expedition, easily could have been an English professor. This guy was very eloquent, but he's not that great militarily. So that that is a big flaw in Lloyd George's judgment is that he bases a whole hell of a lot on one's ability to articulate clearly. So, because of that, he's looking for a soldier who's eloquent, someone who can really express himself on terms that Lloyd George can understand. And Haig and Robertson are both not that guy. Uh, Both of them are known to grunt a good deal and be kind of terse, like I said. But two men who are really good at articulation are two French generals who speak English at a high level, Foch and Nivelle. So Foch and Nivelle are able to speak in a language that Lloyd George understands. And so he actually at one point dreams of improving Anglo-French cooperation by basically just allowing French commanders to issue orders directly to the five British armies without reference to the British commander-in-chief. So effectively, the British commander-in-chief of the BEF would just be there to issue supplies, and he wouldn't actually command battles. Um, But ultimately, he and Neville meet to work this out. Neville, of course, says, yeah, I love that. That sounds like a great idea. Um, And when he draws up the proposal, Neville goes too far. He kind of comes across as arrogant. So that way, when Lloyd George met with his generals, Haig and Robertson, and proposed it, when he read the actual proposal, he's like, oh, wait, never mind. We can't do this. This is too far. So Lloyd George technically stabbed the French in the back because he basically offered them full control of the British Army and then backed out at the very last minute once he realized that this was not a great idea. And, of course, you might imagine this also makes him a little bit less trustworthy in the eyes of Haig and Robertson, who almost got completely sidelined without being relieved of command. Um, now, Lloyd George also does get savaged in the press, probably because Robertson or someone else leaked some stuff. And basically said that Lloyd George would cause another Gallipoli, Gallipoli or coot through his inter- meddling. But Lloyd George then got pissed off by this, and he said, No, I'm a good strategist. Fuck you. I'm resigning. And that's actually what brought down the government. So Lloyd George, wow. in a fit of temper... Uh, resigns, and that brings down the Asquith government. Damn. And then, in the chaos, Lloyd George is able to put together a new coalition, gets a lot of support from conservatives as well, and then on December 6th, he forms a new government with himself as the Prime Minister, and this will hold until 1922. And of course, he basically just keeps up the same policies. There's not a huge sea change, but you have a much bigger name at the top. And at this point, people can't uh, suggest that he's an idiot because he's in charge. And um, so, obviously, he he is pretty important now uh, as the war's ending. One of his first actions is to publicly rebuff Woodrow Wilson's offer to mediate peace between the Entente and the Central Powers. 
basically saying the war had to be fought to the bitter finish because before America entered, Wilson tried to play peacemaker. And another of his priorities remained keeping casualties low. And because of that, he's pretty hostile to the Western Front and wants to find other possibilities. That's part of why he was interested in going to Salonika and to Romania. Because he figured, here we can beat up the Austrians and lose less men. Mm. Um, he also wanted to go after the Ottomans. And he actually gets a lot of pushback from this, by the way. So he's, the, he's in many ways, the big pusher of Allenby's campaign. And, okay. of course, that ends up rolling up the Ottomans and basically eliminating most of their empire. But at the time, this idea was something that most people in the British Army thought was completely idiotic. So he does this against all advice. And um, also, to be fair, he n neither he nor his generals knew how much the Ottomans had been weakened by the Armenian Genocide. Um, so it was a risk, but it did work out. Uh, in the post-war era, right after the war ends, of course, he is important in the peace process. And he he does insist on reparations, just like the French leader. And, of course, that fucks up Wilson's plan to try to have peace without uh, victory, peace without punishment. And, in many ways, you, I think you can argue was a cause of World War II. Because it creates the hostility in Germany that leads to the rise of Hitler. Um, Definitely. Yeah. So it's interesting, though, in one regard, the case can be made that they got the, the worst of both worlds because the peace was not harsh enough to really prevent Germany from coming back again, but it's harsh enough to make sure they're pissed the next time. Yeah, I mean, and the part of that is because you have these two, the compromise between the Wilsonian and Lloyd George visions. Um uh, actually, I'd say no. Between the Wilson, it's between the uh, Wilsonia and the Clemenceau vision. Well, yeah, I mean, because um, I mean, the French are obviously much, much p more pissed about the war because their country got fucking wrecked. Yeah, I'm not. I mean, I don't have a hard opinion on this one, but I think I, I've heard a decent case made for if the French had actually gotten their way at the Treaty of Versailles, there's no World War II. Yeah, I don't know about that, but it's worth exploring. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That's an interesting alternative history scenario. Let's we'll think about that. Um... But yeah, I mean, Lloyd George was much more with Clemenceau than with Wilson, though. And I think Wilson went into it thinking that his fellow English speaker would be on his side, and obviously that didn't happen. Um, so his his view of the British generals as unimaginative, unfeeling butchers, that's basically been the standard view. I think it's been challenged quite a bit, but it's I think it's still the standard view. And that was basically what he was telling the public from the outset. And he also contributes to it. We'll get into it when we talk about John French, but um, Lloyd George was all about these generals savaging each other in ways that were embarrassing and damaging. So he promotes middle-aged man drama a lot because it helps reinforce the narrative that he wanted of the generals. That's hilarious. <laughs> so it's like, it's like the equivalent of if Lincoln had lived and he had led his generals and especially the Confederates and he encouraged them to write these really... Uh, really savage memoirs where they go after each other but yeah you should write that for sure and then tried to intervene to prevent uh, other people from writing who might be a little bit more on point so we'll talk about how he does that uh, when we get to John French um, also after his government down, uh, fell in 1922 he remained an MP for the rest of his life serving uh, Carnarvon which is of course the largest city in Wales I don't know if I pronounced that right or not but just look up the largest city in Wells, and you can figure out what I was saying. Uh, two things that tend to work against him in terms of memory are, first, he was a, an advocate of the punitive peace, and second, during the 1930s, at first, he was pro-German and also pro-Hitler. So he actually, at one point, called Hitler the German George Washington. But he eventually figured out, oh, wait, no, Hitler's fucked in the head. So by 1937, he went from advocating peace and cooperation to loudly, basically, calling Chamberlain a coward. It's uh, interesting, though. That, mean, that actually means he, he, can, he, amongst people who liked Hitler at first, he converted rather quickly. But that makes sense, too, because by the time you get to 37, not only do you have Germany acting more aggressively, but um, that's really when the racial policies are getting kicked, are getting kicked into gear, too. Right. 
Fun fact, um, a lot of Germans who fled Germany when Hitler was elected, a lot of Jews who fled Germany, actually moved back. Huh. Because... Well, because the first few years, the, Ger- the the Nazis really didn't do that much. You know, they concentrate on, like, you know, employment. Yeah. <clears throat> um, also, another interesting thing he did in the 1930s, he proposed basically the Lloyd George New Deal, which was literally just a copy-paste of FDR. I don't think it passed, though. But anyway, I mean, he remained pretty powerful for the rest of his life. Um, what do you think of uh, Lloyd George when it comes to ranking... It's a hard one. There's, there's definitely a lot of successes, but he could also be very difficult to work with. <coughs> Sorry. He also looms very large in British politics of this era and in their entire memory and understanding of the war as well. Um, what's your first thought for a uh, rating? Um, I mean, I guess we got to figure out how much we rank, we rank the war itself versus the peace. Because he's involved in both. Um, mm. I, I think he, he didn't do a great job during the peace process. During the war, I don't really know if he made any huge mistakes. I mean, he was kind of a dick to the generals, but... I I mean, because I think he was he was harsh, but I don't think he was necessarily unfair, if that makes sense. Uh, I agree. And I actually mostly side with him in his arguments with the generals. But I guess in the whole, like, British generals as butchers versus... Um, misunderstood. I slightly favor the butcher narrative more. Yeah, with, with the caveat though that um, the British generals are not as guilty as a lot of their colleagues, simply because Britain couldn't afford to lose the manpower more so than anything right. else. So they had yeah, to be but, a little bit smarter about shit than say the Germans yeah, there, or the French. There's still gonna be some egregious shit though. Um, I don't don't I wouldn't count the peace in this case. Just the war. Just make it that way. Um, you know, that could be a separate thing, so... I think if you're talking about the war, I'd say, like, maybe a B. I'm inclined to agree. I think he's... I think if I were living in Britain at the time, I, I would probably have a reasonable amount of confidence in Lloyd George without thinking that he's, you know, the second coming of Alfred the Great or something. He definitely provided a stronger centralized leadership than Asquith, even though he essentially did all of Asquith's stuff. I mean, you know? he does it with more panache... Which I think is important in a war where you're losing men like that. You need to have a leader you believe in who's got some charisma. And I, mm. although I think he does focus too much on eloquence, it is very important for a politician to have eloquence, especially if you're asking for sacrifice. Yeah, definitely. So, next up we have, I believe that would be Kitchener, right? Yes, Herbert Kitchener, the first Earl Kitchener, Secretary of State for War. I would argue the only consequential Secretary of State for War Britain had during the entire conflict. Unless you count Lloyd George, who, you know, as I mentioned, didn't have a lot of direct control. The other ones, just for those of you interested, are Edward Stanley and Alfred Milner. But by this point, the Secretary of State for War had basically been written out as being pretend, uh, all that important. And while these men were important in their own time, their actual influence over war policy was not that great. At least not great enough to make this list. So what are your thoughts on Herbert Kitchener? Sean? Yeah, sorry. Website got a little slow. Ah. Um... No thoughts. I, I don't. I just know he's on posters, really. Okay, so for Herbert Kitchener, I don't have a ton of notes here, but I do know enough to talk about him in brief, at least. Basically, this was the grand old man of the British Empire at this time. Well, yeah, he, he, he'd been the Boer War, right? He was their commander? Yeah, he was the commander-in-chief of the Boer War, and he had been in a lot of the other battles as a more junior officer. So, I mean, this is the guy who has been in the shit, uh, more so than anyone else, and he's done well consistently... He's very popular, and he's also got a lot of pull with politicians. And he was the head of the cavalry, and a lot of his subordinates are the men who will ultimately go on to hold high commands. So John French and Haig and a lot of other people are Kitchener men. And that's why they get to where they're at. 
because Kitchener has a ton of pull. Kitchener is in really tight with, I believe, Asquith and maybe even Lloyd George. I don't know Lloyd George. I don't think Lloyd George is much, but he, he was in well with Asquith. And also, Kitchener knows the king, the queen, every noble. I mean, this is a guy who is the best connected person in Britain. The thing he has going against him is that he's just a little bit too old. I believe he's in his late 60s by this point. So he's not going to get the BEF. So if he had been just a few years younger, I think he'd have been much happier because I think that's really, really wanted. But instead, they take his protege, John Francis, and him. Uh, and then Kitchener is stuck at home trying to basically be the face of the war effort and to provide them with sage counsel. And really, I think one of his problems is that all of his experience was in basically bush wars. Because he had never fought a major conflict, despite all of his experience. The other problem, of course, is that he has to compete with other sources of influence. He has to compete with Churchill, even, who's still young at the time, but well-connected. You have, as we mentioned, Lloyd George, who's pulling a lot of strings in the Liberal Party. Uh, in many ways, Lloyd George was the head of the Liberal Party, even when Asquith was Prime Minister. Um, Asquith, of course, has his ideas. Um, you got Robertson, the Chief of Staff of the British Army. You have French and Haig. So Kitchener, while he does have, he is at the center of the web. He's not necessarily pulling the strings. He does have a lot of influence on strategy early on, and he has to approve things like Gallipoli, for instance. And although a lot of the things that happen are not his fault because of his stature, people assume that he must have been the architect of a lot of this stuff. So he's, he's losing stature as time goes on in the war. And um, that makes it difficult for him. So basically by the time he dies, his stature, his power is basically gone. As we mentioned, um, now Robertson and Asquith had a direct line. So Kitchener's already been cut out. And yeah. then he effectively becomes a martyr because a boat he was on was uh, destroyed by a U-boat and he died in 1916. Oh, didn't know that. Um, yeah, he kind of feels like the Winfield Scott of this war, in some ways. Although I'd say Scott probably was um, had more respect and was of more consequence to yes. uh, the U.S. Um, also, I guess, to be fair to Scott, at least he didn't think he was going to take command because he knew he was way too old. With Kitchener, mm -hmm. even though he was a little bit too old on paper, I think in terms of his physical health, he felt more than able to go out and get it done. So I think for yeah. him, this was that much more frustrating. Because he was still a very vigorous man. He just happened to be in his late 60s. Um, and he's not a politician, and he's not he's not cut out for this job, I don't think. But he does look good on the posters. He's great people, on the posters. And people know him. Yeah, people know his face. And he's got all the medals, and uh, he's been famous since the dawn of time. So, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know exactly what decisions he was responsible for. Uh, I feel like he was more of a filter rather than an originator of ideas. But um, what do you think of what do you think of Kitchener in terms of ratings? Um, I don't know. Actually, this is a hard one for me um, because, in, I mean, in one regard, you're you're talking about his certain limitations, but. He is very important also for uh, rallying people to the war effort early on. Yes. No, he is. He's basically, like we said, he is literally the poster child. Yeah. And also when they when they have new volunteer units who are sent to reinforce the original BEF, they're called Kitchener's Army because Kitchener's the guy rallying men. Come out with your friends and sign up. So they create the what are called the PALS battalions, where they're called... So people yeah. like would go with their local rugby team and sign up in mass, and actually had to turn people away because they didn't have enough equipment. Uh, so, but yeah, it also meant that a lot of times when people would sign up with their pals, they would all get butchered together on the Western Front, so a whole town would lose all its men <coughs> in a single day. Um, so eventually, they quit that practice and started mixing men together more uh, to avoid having an entire town lose all its men on a single day. <coughs> um, 
But yeah, Kitchener apparently could inspire confidence. Um, he was definitely not a military genius, that much is clear. I don't think he really had any ideas for how to deal with World War One's problems. He also didn't really seem to have many ideas for how to break the stalemate, or not the stalemate, but to deal with the French more effectively. Mm. Uh, so I think he would have been better at doing that than, say, John French. But, um, yeah, he just seems like somebody who I think is in the wrong position. Actually, this is one of those rare instances where Britain would have been better off going with the older guy. Where just putting Kitchener with the BEF might have been a better move than putting him where he was. Yeah. <coughs> so... I mean, I'm inclined to be somewhat merciful, but I, I, I have to say D at highest. Yeah, go the D then. Yeah. All right. Next up, we have Sir John French, the first commander of the BEF in 1914. Um, so, as I mentioned at the outset, the traditional narrative of World War One for the British is that all their officers were these aristocratic cavalrymen who lived in chateaus and didn't give a shit about their men. Um, now, this is not fair to all the generals. For instance, while Haig meets that requirement in most, in most ways, we know from his diary that he actually was troubled by the losses. However, there is a guy who does meet this description to a T, and that man is John French. This is a guy who was the stereotype of the British general in World War I. Uh, in every way. And also, in addition to being... So, John French is very proud. He's overbearing. Um, he's a womanizer. He loves luxury. And by 1914, he was also fat. So, this is a guy who looks ridiculous in this command. And he doesn't look like he belongs there. Intellectually, he's not up to snuff when it comes to dealing with the problems that a modern war will present. He'd never done well academically in his... Uh, I don't even know if he went to staff college. I think he might have skipped it. Um, also, it's interesting. He, he owes his positions to his ability to social climb. He didn't come from a well-off family, believe it or not. But he was at least charming enough when he needed to be to borrow money. Uh, and because at this time the British Army was seen as a gentleman's pursuit, at least when he was a young man, French was constantly in debt. That and he had a gambling problem. So at one point he had to borrow a bunch of money from Douglas Haig, who was from a wealthy family, in order to prevent himself from getting embroiled in a scandal. And it would appear that uh, from a from an early age, Haig probably knew that French was a bit on the dumb side, but he rode his coattails anyway because French had charisma and had connections. And I, as I mentioned, Haig was not necessarily a well-spoken man, but he was quietly competent usually and also had money. So French is more, as a young man, is more this dashing figure who, I guess in many ways, John French is literally Zap Brannigan from Futurama. But not nearly as funny, right? Right, without the sense of humor, because John French also is a bitter motherfucker who could hold grudges like no other. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, John French constantly gets in trouble. Um, at one point in the early 1890s, he had got caught with a mistress, and that's where he had to borrow money from Douglas Haig to pay her off. The army found out, and they put him on leave, and it was supposed to be a leave where the idea is like, yeah, you should quietly not come back. Uh, but he does come back. So whenever somebody get put on leave for personal misconduct, the new term in the British Army was French leave. And it's not because it's a French Army practice, but because of John French. So everybody knew that he had fucked up, but it didn't really hold back his career at all. He also fucked another officer's wife at one point, which, I mean, if you're going to do adultery, that's... That's the line. I mean, that's not you do not fuck another officer's wife. John French did it though, and that's actually where he got his French leave. Um, but then he had to be recalled because he needed a fighter for a colonial war, and John French, if nothing else, was a fighter. 
and he did fairly well in the Boer Wars as the cavalry commander under Kitchener. However, he is one of those guys who is not able to understand technology. Or the significance of technology, I should say. Um, he's a dogmatic upholder of the traditional use of cavalry with sabers and doing its traditional role. So he's still thinking like Napoleon here. Um, he also still believed in lances, by the way. Yeah, I heard about that. Um, so French basically thought that you could use your cavalrymen to maneuver infantry into into your artillery. So basically he wanted to use them to corral people. Um, and once... And so uh, here's, the, here's the source of his beef with Smith, Smith Dorian, who is uh, a subordinate who later went on to be a corps commander with the BEF and later an army commander. The beef is the stupidest shit in the world, but this is apparently something that he really felt at the heart at his heart. So Smith Dorian uh, took over a position French had held, training uh, the fr the British cavalry, and he understood technology enough to know you can't actually ride into battle anymore because you present too tempting a target for machine guns. So he taught his men to fight as mounted infantry and to do shoot and move like the infantry. And actually, mm. uh, Smith Dorian did a great job drilling the men right before the war. But French held a grudge, and they actually had a shouting match over this, where French brought him to his headquarters for his new command. He said, How, what in the fuck are you doing? Don't you understand cavalry traditions? Have you betrayed our order? Uh, what the fuck is wrong with you? And then basically Smith Dorian called him an idiot, and they started yelling at each other. And uh, this, was a, this was a breach that never healed. Before this point, they were friends. But after this, uh, Smith, the French literally had a smoldering hatred for Smith Dorian. Um, so anyway... That was a big deal, and uh, he never got over it. He never forgave Smith Dorian for understanding technology. Um, and also, anybody else who advocated that line of thought was somebody he would make an enemy. So Douglas Haig, for instance, uh, retained French's goodwill because he never said that out loud. So even though Douglas Haig literally went behind French's back to get him fired later... And everybody knew who had done it, including John French. French apparently never got all that mad at Haig for doing it. He was still pissed off at Smith Dorian over the cavalry tactics thing. Which is weird, but that, that's, where, that's what he was more pissed about. He was more pissed about that than he was about uh, having someone backstab him in a literal way. I don't know. Uh, there was a, I don't know how you pronounce this, an Irish city, uh, Carog. Incident, 1914, early 1914, French was at the heart of the controversy and um, effectively said that if the Irish kept revolting that he would take in the army and put it down by force. And a lot of his fellow officers were outraged by this, especially the ones who were conservatives and friendly to the Ulster cause. Uh, French was pressured into resigning, but managed to survive, and a lot of that was because he was good friends with Asquith Kitchener, Lord Grey, Churchill, and many others. So, once again, French is also another one of these guys who has the connections. Despite the fact that it doesn't make sense why he has the connections he has. He apparently just has some sort of personal magnetism that's hard to explain. Um, what it does show, though, is that this man does not have tact. And he also doesn't have a lot of political sense. And, of course, that would be a problem when you need him to cooperate with the French. And he is the guy who was tapped to head the BEF when it is first deployed. Um, he is against going to France. He wants to go to Belgium instead and land at Antwerp. But the Royal Navy basically says that's not going to work. And Haig and Churchill also both say that's a bad plan, so French relents and goes to France instead. And because the BF is small and would rely on the French for logistics, they're, they're expecting John French to be conciliatory toward his French colleagues. It's also safe to say, um, despite the fact that his name is French, John French actually does not know a word of French, the language. And he also apparently has a visceral hatred of the French before he even gets there. I'm not sure why. And apparently, the French do a really terrible job of choosing the guy who will be right next to the BEF. Because the guy right on the southern flank of the BEF 
is a commander named Lonrazok, who is an Anglophobe. So you can see how this is going already. The two men quickly decide that they hate each other and they refuse to really talk much, so that's going to create a lot of problems in 1914. And in many ways, um, what Anglo-French cooperation there is relies upon the friendship between Robertson and Ferdinand Foch. Because both of them had been friends and Robertson was pretty friendly with the French, as was Wilson, who was a, a flat-out Francophile. Um, but a lot of the commanders, including French, are pretty hardcore Francophobes. And in time, Haig will also become a Francophobe, but his evolution takes longer. So the early BEF has two corps. You have Haig with first corps, Smith Dorian with second corps. Now, French apparently likes and trusts Haig, and of course he hates Smith Dorian. But in the early battles, as they're retreating to try to find a new line, French doesn't really do that much because he can't. And the corps commanders are on their own, but both battles that are fought early on are both Smith Dorian battles. And then they have a cavalry unit commanded by Allenby. And interestingly enough, both corps commanders are from the cavalry. Obviously, the cavalry is commanded by a cavalryman, and then your supreme commander is John French from the cavalry. So the people who say the British Army wasn't dominated by all horsemen are full of shit, frankly. So this is going on. Uh, by the time you get to late 1914, the BF did really well. In some of their battles, they put up so much volume of rifle fire that the Germans thought the British were way better equipped with machine guns than they actually were. Um, but both corps get decimated by the end of the year, and a lot of that old professional BF is gone, so you're relying on the new Kitchener units. And... Um, the British are also short of damn near everything, so this is largely a fault of industry. But, um, yeah, French, of course, is not making things any better. He's not really... I don't think he really understands trench warfare that well. Um, he also does not get along well with Joffrey or Foch. And in 1915, this will be the worst year of the war for France because they try some really stupid offensives that fail horribly. And the uh, John French will have to cooperate with those, and of course he doesn't really know how to get the job done, and when he fails, he blames, usually tries to blame Smith Dorian for everything. Uh, his army does increase to have two armies in it, but one under Haig, one under Smith Dorian, rather than two corps. And basically he pins all the blame on Smith Dorian for everything that goes wrong, gets him sacked. But by the end of 1915, he himself gets removed, because Douglas Haig is friends with the king, among others, and basically points out all of John French's obvious shortcomings. And so, uh, in December 1915, French gets sacked finally, after the failure at Luz, which was very costly and very poorly executed. Um, so, French will write a memoir in 1919 about 1914, simply titled 1914. <laughs> and you might think he's bit pissed off because by now he knows that Haig betrayed him and then stole credit for winning the war. But instead, it's basically a long diatribe about how Smith Dorian fucking sucks. And, um, yeah, so it's, it's basically it's one of the most embarrassing memoirs ever written because it is so bitter and ridiculous. And Lloyd George is all about him writing this, by the way. Because he said, yes, go attack your fellow officers, show how idiotic they are. And when Smith Dorian asked to write a rebuttal, Lloyd George intervened and said, no, you're a serving officer, you cannot rebut this. Although technically, prime, uh, field marshals never retire. So in theory, Lloyd George should have told John French he could not publish this in his lifetime. But he doesn't. And he does prevent um, Smith Dorian from striking back. But needless to say, none of the officers take this shit seriously. And pretty much all of them are on Smith Dorian's side. And actually... Every military historian since has been on Smith Dorian's side of this controversy. Um, so yeah, John French, what do you think about him as a general and as a BEF commander? Uh, yeah, he's kind of always struck me as a disaster, really. Um, yeah, uh, I never anything I've read about 1914. I've 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 never really thought too highly of the man. Um, 
I do. I, I, I do. I've always find I always find like uh, ridiculously. I always find ridiculously bitter memoirs hilarious, though. Yeah. No, it, it is. I imagine it is a great read. It's just called 1914. For those of you who are interested in it, you can go to uh, probably Z Books and like that and find it. It shouldn't be too hard. What year did it come out again? It came out in 1919. So it's right oh, after wow. the war. And. Mm. Um, yeah, John French made a fool of himself, but um, I've often seen him rated to be the um, worst of the major British commanders. Uh, I, I have no reason not to not to think that's the case. Uh, the BEF did do well, but it wasn't really because of him. Yeah, no, actually, the two battles they won early on, uh, he was Smith Dorian's corps was not even in contact with. Uh, French's headquarters. The French had nothing to do with either of those battles. Yeah, and um, I mean, I'm all, I'm all for F here, man. I am too. Uh, John French is terrible. He sucks, and he's <laughs> he's not as bad as Cadorna or Enver Pasha, but he's still pretty goddamn bad. He also doesn't have the power those men wield. Well, that's true, and I mean, can you imagine if he did? <laughs> Britain would be speaking German today. <laughs> All right, next up is another controversial figure. John French's replacement, Douglas Haig. I'd say yeah, it's easy to say that he often is used as sort of the face of the British officer corps for World War One because he was the BF commander for the bulk of the conflict. And also, even before that, he was commanding at least half of the BF, so you know he's, he's got a pretty long tenure. Uh, Haig is Scottish. He was born in Edinburgh, and his family uh, came from wealthy whiskey distillers. But he also lacked social standing. So his family, they were kind of parvenus. So he's not from one of the old families. But at the same time, the British Army has opened up enough that men who aren't aristocratic can make it. And even men like French who aren't wealthy can make it. So it's not as big of an obstacle as it might seem. And Haig was a pretty adept social climber, despite not having the best social skills, which is interesting. Um, Haig had a lot of experience working with the cavalry in Africa, but his the difference between him and most of the cavalrymen is that Haig actually was academically gifted, and he had a lot of experience at the staff level. So Haig is someone who actually can see the big picture a little better than a lot of the guys we talked about so far. And because if you look at how much social networking he does, it's also obvious that this guy does have a strategic mind on some level. I mean, there, there's something happening upstairs. He's not a complete idiot. I mean, it, he's far from a military genius, but we're not talking about John French here. And one of his more brilliant moves was to network himself with the royal family. So he met a, a lady in waiting, and he shocked her by proposing marriage out of the blue. This is fairly late in his life. He was born in 1861. I think he doesn't get married until the early 1900s. So he waits till he's about in his early 40s, and then he proposes off the cuff to one of the queen's ladies-in-waiting. Uh, so this gives him a direct line to the court, and he also has a chance to make friends with King George V. And apparently the two of them continued to meet and hang out during the war. So when George V would visit the front, he would visit wherever Haig was and get Haig's views of, view of things. And while the king doesn't have a hell of a lot of power directly, he still has influence. And he knows all the people who do have power. So Haig's views are always being promoted by the king. Mm. Um, Haig also is able to win over Kitchener because he does good service. So Kitchener was looking for sort of a group of junior officers to take with them on his campaigns and he identified Haig pretty early on as a guy who will get the job done. So Haig is sort of in that golden circle. Um, French is also in that circle, and French also likes Haig because he knows that Haig uh, is a pretty good officer, and also he's got money that he can loan him when he gets in trouble through gambling and whoring. So French has to have Haig around as a personal ATM. And then for Haig, French has a certain charisma and he has connections that Haig can latch on to. So it is kind of a 
I don't want to call it a symbiotic relationship. It's more like a, a host and a parasite, you know? But the question is, who's the host and who's the parasite? I don't even know. Um, and actually, the two of them were relatively close before the war. For 25 years, they counted themselves as friends. Also, I think I mentioned it earlier, but um, we actually have no definitive proof that French ever found out that Haig got him fired and called him incompetent behind his back. I don't know how he, wanted, he couldn't have found out, though, because I feel like with as prickly as French was, eventually if somebody would get in an argument with him and say, listen, motherfucker, you know who got you fired? It was your good buddy Douglas Haig. Yeah, suck on that. But anyway... Uh, there's a good pot. There is at least a possibility that French never found out. Um, now, Haig, one of his shortcomings, as I mentioned earlier with Floyd George, is that he is not a very good speaker. If you asked him to articulate his strategy, it would be a lot of sentence fragments and grunts and umming. It would sound pretty bad. But that does not mean that he's dumb. He's far from dumb. So, uh, because of that, when he's speaking with other officers, they take his opinions very seriously. Because they know that Haig understands things and actually reads books and studies in ways that a lot of them still don't. Uh, the British Army, while it is professionalizing, there are still a lot of men in its ranks who do not think of things like staff college as being serious endeavors. I mean, even Smith Dorian admitted in one of his memoirs or something like that that Basically, he just played sports and dicked around during staff college because he didn't take it seriously. All right. Um, so Haig at staff college, by contrast, put in a ton of work. And if anything, he was a workaholic. He published several papers. And he also did have some uh, astuteness for army politics. So he's very good at figuring out whose ass he needs to kiss and when. And as I mentioned earlier, he did, I think, publish a paper defending French's view of how cavalry should be used. Now, it's unclear if he meant it or whether he was just trying to uh, stay in the good graces of the traditionalist. But certainly, he never had an opportunity to fuck things up by sending in men with lances. So we don't really know if it was sincere or just political posturing. And I guess either possibility is possible, right? We don't know. Um... Actually, if any, actually, he published a paper where he said that he thought cavalry would become more dominant because of the machine gun. And, uh, again, this, this paper was hilariously wrong because Haig could be persuasive. A lot of people thought this paper was brilliant at the time. Really? Yeah. Uh, especially people like John French. <laughs> yeah, who, that boy's well, telling them what they want to hear. Yeah, I mean, it's basically preaching to the choir for John French, uh, but even a lot of people who were on the other side of it, they said, damn, that's a pretty good argument. Fuck. <laughs> of course, it was completely 100% wrong. But, I mean, as the same token, we talked about the French generals earlier. A lot of them were very intelligent people who were advocating for the cult of the offensive. It doesn't mean that they were stupid. It just means they were very wrong about it. And I think there's a big difference between being stupid and being wrong. Uh, if you're intelligent and you're wrong, sometimes you can really entrench yourself in a way that somebody who's dumb and wrong can't. And do damage that way. Um, so Haig's first brush with battle, once he gets to the front, won't come until a little bit later. So Smith Dorian's already fought two battles by the time Haig fights. And uh, he will fight at the Marne. And while he is fighting at the Marne, uh, is, which is a retreat, battle of retreat, he forms a pretty negative impression of the French generals and soldiers. And basically, because of this, for the rest of the war, he will always question the valor of French troops, which I think is a pretty ridiculous position. Now, if you question the French generals, I think that's justified. But questioning the valor of the French troops, looking at the kind of casualties they suffered and kept fighting through, <clears throat> that's just fucking stupid. Yeah. Uh, so he fought the first battle of the Marne, and he also was part of the race of the sea. He suffered huge casualties, and at one point he went from 18,000 effectives to only 3,000 by November 1914. 
So remember we talked about the death of the BEF. Well, Hay got to see that firsthand. Mm. Uh, his core got fucked up so bad he had to be removed from the line and replaced with a replacement core. And also the French at one point had troops to the north and south of the British because of uh, the British having a lack of manpower available on the scene, fully armed and ready to go. Um, now, interestingly enough, French was pretty pleased with how well Haig had done. And also, French was having heart issues at the time. So, actually, in late 1914, John French wrote back to London and asked to be replaced with Haig. But London said no. So, I guess to be fair to French, maybe even if he did know about Haig's intrigues, maybe he was like, yeah, they should have fucking removed me. <laughs> I asked for it. Uh, so actually it's possible maybe Haig was intriguing with French's permission. I don't know. Um, I guess that is an interesting possibility. Neither one of them ever said anything about it, but I'd be, I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case. So French will remain in command for the rest of 1915. Haig will be pretty underwhelmed by him. And I guess by the end of 1914, Haig said that he was pretty thoroughly convinced that French was not up for the job. Um... And also, Haig came to really hate Henry Wilson, who was the chief of staff of the BEF, because Henry Wilson was a hardcore Francophile. Uh, so Haig hated him. Yeah, he was. He was. Uh, he he'd been the one involved in the planning um, before the war, to uh, you know the uh, the planning for the BEF to get over there in the first place. Yeah, and also Haig made full general in late 1914, and his corps was made an army, first army. So he was always intended as the heir to John French, and then in 1915 he fights battles as a commanding general. I mean, you guys know the litany of battles on the Western Front. I won't go through a lot of them. As an army commander, on the tactical level, he does all right. He does make adjustments. Nothing spectacular. And he has his mistakes. Then he becomes BF commander. By that point, he has five armies under his command, so there's a lot less direct tactical involvement, but he still does planning. And he offers up critiques and tactical changes. Uh, one thing you can say in his favor is that Haig does change things up when things fail. He doesn't keep doing the same shit over and over and over. He does make adjustments. At the same time, he never really comes up with anything particularly brilliant. Uh, he does figure out you need a lot of artillery, but fucking everyone knew that. So that was obvious. Um, and really the reason why he kept his command as long as he did is simply because he was very politically adept he had a lot of connections and then there was no one who was clearly and unmistakably better than he was because all the other guys on the western front none of them really had some sort of breakthrough performance where they just absolutely owned the Germans so there was no one who became a hero and was really pushed for army for uh, Supreme Command. Um, so Haig basically just held on to the end because he was there and he hadn't done anything too fucked up to deserve to be relieved. So, I mean, it was a tough job, though, as we mentioned. The French could be very difficult to work with. Um, it, breaking the stalemate in the Western Front was fucking really difficult. I mean... The French and Germans also don't really figure this out either, to be fair. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, Douglas Haig? Uh, he, yeah, he... Um, I, I don't particularly hold him in very high regard. Um, he, do, he, he does try different things, but I still think he's a relatively slow learner. Uh, the thing about him being good at army politics makes a lot of sense. Uh, that kind of reminds you of Grant, where he's not a man who's particularly charismatic, but he, uh, you know, Grant figured out very quickly during the Civil War who to ingratiate myself with. And, you know, one, one little telling episode is that um, when Lincoln told Grant, I want to send troops to Texas, Grant was like, no, we should go to Mobile. And then Lincoln's like, I really want to send troops to Texas. And then Grant's next letter is, great idea. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I mean, be, being able to play politics is not necessarily a matter of uh, charisma or charm. You know, a lot, of it, a lot of it also just has to do with purely knowing who to operate with. Uh, yeah, it didn't work particularly well with the French. 
Uh, do you know? Did you did you know anything much about his relationship with the Americans? Um, I don't know much about it actually. Apparently, Pershing liked him. Oh. Um. Yeah. yeah apparently, Pershing liked him and got along with him, but I don't really see him as being some master of uh, coordination or even uh, the other thing too. I think it's good that you noted was that there wasn't like there were other generals in the Western Front who excelled enough to replace him. Or to make it clear that he should be replaced. Yeah, because, I mean, Lloyd George was searching for a replacement, but he would look at all his options and say, that's a lateral move at best. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, and, we, we, I mean, we could say that um, in 1918, you know, the British Army and the French Army are both using tactics and weapons to break the Germans. And there's a lot, there's a lot of reasons to praise them. And, of course... Um, uh, Diaz as well in Italy that a lot of these journals had learned the hard lessons but at the same time the only counter the one thing I counterbalance that with is they are facing the central powers that are on their uh, last leg you know that the, the I've always believed that the dominant the, the, the decisive thing in winning World War I was the British blockade of Germany which starves them to death that, that to me is the decisive thing in the war um, so you know, but but it's, I mean, you have a combination of allied tactics have significantly improved, and they're also facing an enemy who is increasingly demoralized and is starving, in some cases, he is economically ravaged. So, um, yeah, I, I kind of view Hague as like a D, really. I agree. I mean, I think they're they're definitely far worse commanders in chief in this war, but. Um... He's not on the level of Armando Diaz. <laughs> no, he's not a Diaz. No, I mean, at the same time, I, he's way the hell above someone like French or Cadorna or Enver Pasha, though. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, the, the gap between F and D in this case is is pretty big. Um, that being said, even though he is, it, by comparison, a breath of fresh, fresh air, I mean, that's that's fresh air without a lot of oxygen in it. <laughs> um, all right so as i mentioned i do have some gaps in my notes due to lack of prep time so now we'll have to be a little bit more pick and choose with this so actually the next three men are henry Rawlinson, charles monroe and henry horn we're going to have to skip all three of them because i don't have enough to do those men justice all three of them were important army commanders on the western front However, I do have enough on Horace Smith Dorian, who is the next man up. Uh, he was born in 1858. We talked about him earlier as the commander of 2nd Corps and later 2nd Army. He had a great deal of distinction as a cavalry officer and had a pretty good record, uh, just like a number of these guys prior to the war. I think a lot of the reason why there is sort of a Smith Dorian fan club now is just because he did get smeared so hard by John French in a way that was obviously personal and unfair. But uh, his life is one that historians tend to be pretty uh, favorable to. Uh, Smith Dorian hailed from a family that had 15 children. So he was the 11th of 15 kids. And his family was very well connected politically. His father had been a colonel which is a fairly high rank if you're trying to get into the military after your father. Now, it's not the same as being a field marshal, but still, your dad will have a little bit of pull and will be able to give you a lot of advice on what to do to make it. And more importantly, his brother was the Lord Proprietor of the Isles of Sicily. So, the family, as I said, very well connected. In early 1879, right after he got out of Sandhurst, he went and fought in Africa. And he took part in one of the greatest disasters that the British faced there at, it was called Isandalwana. So he got blooded pretty early. He also survived, it was a massacre at the hands of the Zulu, who was one of only five officers who escaped. And he did acquit himself with great bravery during a harrowing retreat. So he is a guy who probably had more personal combat experience than most of the people we've talked about so far. I actually say definitely had more personal combat experience than any of those guys. Um, he served in Egypt with Charles Gordon, who was kind of the uh, pre-Kitchener-Kitchener, if you will. 
So Charles Gordon was the great old man of the Empire, and then he died, and then it became Kitchener. Uh, so he's in Egypt with Gordon. Um, he That's where he becomes friends with Kitchener. They would become very close. He had some knee problems, and he also was present at a battle called the Battle of Guinness, or I don't know if it's Guinness or Genis, but it's G-E-N-N-I-S in 1885, which is significant because that's the last battle where the British fought wearing red coats. I think the Redcoats had already been phased out in other uh, armies that the British had, but this was the last one where they would march out in those and fight. He went to staff college at Camberley in the late 1880s, but it was new and no one respected it, so he basically said he just dicked around the whole time. Um, he went to India, he went to Sudan, he fought the dervishes, he led a regiment. Um, so basically, the point I'm trying to make, I'm just going to skip over a lot of this, he went to the Second Boer War... Um, he assaulted a fortress. He did a lot of shit. I mean, this is a guy who, he's he's a fighting general. So whereas Haig had a lot more staff and big picture kind of, uh, it had a big picture outlook, had a lot of staff training. Uh, Smith Dorian is the guy you would call on if you want to storm a fortress, because that's what he did. Um, let's see. So he took over a command at Aldershot in Britain from John French in 1907. And this is where they fall out, because Aldershot was basically the, the home base of the cavalry. And this is where he instituted the new training to basically work as mounted infantry. And he had a lot of backing, and including from Ian Hamilton and Lord Roberts. And Ian Hamilton is normally considered to be an idiot because of his performance at Gallipoli, but in terms of his ability to think, Ian Hamilton was actually pretty smart. Uh, in terms of his understanding in the broad sense. Uh, but French, of course, was really pissed off. Haig was pissed off too, but not as much. And that's what caused that whole controversy between them. Uh, Smith Dorian is also a very strict disciplinarian. He was an organizer. He improved conditions on base. He made men uh, more accountable with their leave passes. And he also did look out, he improved conditions on base in terms of housing and food, though. He was anti-whoring, so he's also the opposite of French in that way. He tried to prevent his men from doing things he saw as immoral. Um, now, to be fair, Smith Dorian, part of the reason why he doesn't engage in whoremongering is not only was he monogamous, but he also had a much younger and very attractive wife, so he had no reason to try to, you know, <coughs> go outside the home. Smith Dorian tried to convince the War Department to replace the Maxim guns with a lighter Vickers gun, which were about as effective but half the weight. But although this was great advice and was eventually adopted, his request was largely ignored at the time. So, I mean, this is a very practical man who thinks through things on, uh, as they would appear on the battlefield because he does have all this combat experience. He was an aide-de-camp to George V, so just like Haig, he's got a personal connection. And the two of them were on a hunt together in Africa, and Smith Dorian impressed the king by killing a rhino and then a bear the next day. So the king is like, man, this guy's a badass. <laughs> Damn. Yeah, so uh, anyway, Smith Dorian is now well connected as well. Uh, I should mention, it'll come up later, he's also super socially conservative, which I guess might have come through with him being anti whoring and drinking, but uh, that will become relevant later on. 1912, he takes up the Southern Command, and this is where he really enforces um, moving while firing, which will be sort of a hallmark of British infantry tactics, and it will be why the early BEF, despite not having enough machine guns and not having enough barbed wire, will be able to hold its own with the Germans, because the men are very adept marksmen, <laughs> and they're very well drilled, and that owes a lot to Smith Dorian. Um... The war broke out while he's still at Southern Command. Originally, he was not supposed to be with the BEF because, again, he's not a French guy. But uh, a, one of the guy who's supposed to be Second Commander's Corps uh, Commander was Grierson, who dies suddenly. And French wanted to put Plumer in command, but Kitchener said, Smith Dorian is your guy. And, of course, as I mentioned, Kitchener is very close with Smith Dorian, so French can't say no. They got along well enough. It was cold but cordial. 
And um, Smith Dorian actually let French know that he was keeping a war journal for the king because the king requested to keep a war journal. So basically, he told him, I'm going to record everything that's said and that we do, just so you know. Uh, and of course, naturally, and actually not uh, accurately, um, French figures out that basically Smith Dorian will report everything he does to the king. But at least Smith Dorian was open, uh, up front about it, right? I mean, so he is honest in that regard. Early battles 1914, as we mentioned, Smith Dorian will bear the brunt of the fighting, and he does very well at the fighting with draws in northern France. He fought two battles at Le Cateau and Mons, and he basically wins both battles to the extent you can win a battle where you're retreating. So these are rear guard actions. He does super well, and at one of them, the German commander swore that he had faced a British force well equipped with machine guns because of the volume of fire that the well-trained riflemen were able to put out. Um, so they fall back. He eventually reunites with Haig's Corps. And also, once Allenby's cavalry are employed in the front line, they also do well because, again, Smith Dorian insisted that the men be trained as dragoons. So they weren't riding in the battle, they were fighting as infantry, and they acquitted themselves just fine. So again, I think you can give Smith Dorian a lot of credit for the performance of the early men because he does do a lot to train both arms right before the war starts. Um, when the BEF expanded, he was given command of 2nd Army. So he and Haig were army commanders together as full generals. At 2nd Eep, he was the main commander. And he cooperated with the French, but the French underdelivered on their promise. They promised him more men than they actually sent. So a lot of that is their fault. And he tried to protest continuing the attack because he thought it was stupid, but French forced him to keep going. So basically it ended up being a disaster. And he also learned that General Poots was going to deploy fewer men than expected. So he also wrote to Robertson in French suggesting that he fall back from the Epe salient because he thought he'd be endangered and he thought he'd lose his artillery. But uh, basically what, the, what happened is that French took this letter and said that Smith Dorian not only had failed, but that he also had lost his nerve. So he used that as an excuse to fire Smith Dorian and replace him with Plumer. Um, and, but the way he did it, though, was super weird because he doesn't technically remove Smith Dorian. He basically just creates a new command and puts Plumer in command of it and takes all Smith Dorian's men and puts them under Plumer. So Smith Dorian technically still commands the second army, but it doesn't really exist except on paper. Uh, so basically Smith Dorian then officially has to ask to be relieved and resigns, goes back to Britain. He takes up commanding the training army from Central Force, so once again he does something he's really good at, he trains men. Then he was asked to go to East Africa, but he got pneumonia while going, but not before he actually planned the initial campaign. So actually Jan Smoots will be executing uh, the plan drawn up originally by Smith Dorian at first. Hmm. Um, let's see. Now he goes back to London, he becomes Commandant of the Tower of London, and spends a lot of time talking about moral purity. So after he bores the shit out of everybody in London, he gets sent to Gibraltar from 1918 to 1923. And here he introduces a bit of democracy, but also a lot of decency laws. He retires to Portugal, actually. or most He spends most of his time in Portugal after he retires. But he also remained very active on the war remembrance front, working with veterans and other things like that. Uh, when he wrote his memoirs in 1925, he was not able to clap back at John French because French was still alive. And then when French died the next year, Smith Dorian defied expectations by traveling and serving as a pallbearer. And apparently John French's son was super impressed that he had done this despite the beef between them, and he was really uh, blown away by Smith Dorian's kindness in that regard. Um, interestingly enough, Smith Dorian is a movie star. In 1926, they made the, uh, the a movie, The Battle of Mons, and Smith Dorian played himself. Damn. Yeah. In 1903, or excuse me, 1930, he died after being badly injured in a car wreck at the age of 72. Uh, Smith Dorian could be moralizing and difficult with his peers, 
but he actually was pretty approachable overall, especially to his men, and he connected well with them. He was technically a cavalryman, but he also had broad experience, and he had served with the infantry and with the mounted infantry, and he also understood how sappers and artillery worked much better than most of his contemporaries. Uh, so what do you think of Smith Dorian? Uh, you know, um, <clears throat> yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that about the democracy stuff and the uh, moral reform. Um, you know, that that's that, that alone is interesting. Um, but all that being said, um, it appears that it's just simply he was a very capable commander. He had the practical experience. Uh, but <clears throat> uh, he just made the wrong enemies, really. And I think it's also telling that you said he had, he had the direct line to the king. So you want to get rid of somebody who might report on you. Which, you know, going back to Grant, that reminds me of, uh, I think one of the reasons Grant didn't like McClernand was something because McClernand was writing letters to Abraham Lincoln. Not that McClernand and Lincoln were like best buds, but um, they, 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 they knew each other. They thought well of each other. Uh, they, worked, they actually worked a case together. And, I mean, Lincoln essentially told McClernand, yeah, why don't you tell me what's going on in the West? So he's his informant. You know? Yeah. Yeah, so that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and I guess a lot of Smith Dorian's importance was some last minute modernization of the British Army in terms of tactics and training. I think that was yeah. really his biggest contribution overall. Um, because I'm, I'm increasingly convinced that, especially going into a war where you have men who have been, uh, who are in a professional army that one of the things that makes a general good is being a good trainer. That's probably more important in many ways than, I guess, brilliance in a traditional sense. <clears throat> uh, he, he, Smith Dorian, though, like any of these guys who's talented but gets, gets railroaded, or at least has his uh, stuff diminished, also gets like a kind of a cult around him. Yeah, exactly, because uh, we don't know what he could have done. We don't know who could have done. He was given a raw deal, and what he did do, he did pretty well. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I'm thinking he's probably a B. Pretty solid. I go with that. Yeah. I, I don't think he had S potential, but I think um, I could see him, if he had stayed, I think he could have been an A. Yeah. All right. Uh, I don't have enough notes on Herbert Plumer, but I do have enough notes on Edmund Allenby. Now, Allenby is, I think it's safe to say, if you took a survey of historians of World War I, I think he would win the contest for best British general. Um, wouldn't you say so? Uh, typically, yeah. Yeah, because there's not really, there's not a lot of competition, as we've talked about. And um, as we'll talk about, Allenby won the most impressive campaign of any British commander. Although, as I'll talk about, I don't think that qualifies as a military genius for a number of reasons, but we'll get there. So, well, yeah, kind of like what I was kind of like what I was saying with Haig, where I mean, yes, it's a really, really well run can really, really, sorry, really well run campaign in 1918, but you are facing an enemy who's got major problems. Yeah, an enemy which has self destructed over the last couple of years and done yeah. immense damage internally to themselves. Um, so, Allen B., uh, not surprisingly, you want to guess what branch of service he comes from? Cavalry. Yep. Uh, in fact, he will be the commander of the BEF's cavalry co contingent when it lands with their cav division. And just like French and Haig, he served in Africa quite a bit, had a lot of experience in the various wars in Africa. Um, so... A lot of it is a lot of his uh, advancement is slowed down compared to Haig because he and Haig are the same age. They're both born in 1861, and actually, he and Haig are lifelong rivals. It's a pretty friendly rivalry. It's not like the French Smith Dorian thing, uh, but it is a very real rivalry. So they don't really talk that much to each other, but they are constantly competing. Um, now, Allen B. By comparison with Haig does just as well in service, but he is not the social networker that Haig is. Um, so Haig is much better at making friends with superiors. So Allenby does his job really well 
when it needs to be done. So he's basically seen as competent but limited. So people see him as, yeah, if you send Allen B with the brigade, he'll go take the hill. Just don't ask him to do anything more than that, and we're probably fine. But the guy always does his job, so we're going to keep promoting him because uh, he's given us no reason not to promote him and seems like a good enough guy. We don't really know him that well, though, but, you know, he does his job. Um, now, Haig also did better at Staff College. He, was, he did more at War Councils. And basically, he was seen as the guy with the brains, whereas Allen B was more of the field guy. Um, Allen B also was interesting because unlike a lot of these guys who were super intense, both in service and out of uniform, Allen B was extremely compartmentalized. So when he was in uniform, he was pretty uh, terse and he tended to be kind of harsh. He could be a total asshole to his fellow officers, actually. And that's part of why he didn't network as well as someone like Haig. Uh, Allen B was humorless with his fellow officers, but as soon as he took off the uniform and went home, he was actually a very loving family man with a great sense of humor and lots of hobbies. And uh, actually, he had a deep passion for natural history, so he loved to collect rocks and stuff like that. And uh, he was going to with his kids. So, I mean, the way they saw him was as this really warm, friendly guy. And he puts on his uniform and he just becomes a straight-up asshole, like, immediately. It's kind of like a Jekyll and Hyde thing. Um... I know what that reminds me of. That reminds me of, um, oh God, who's that guy? It was um, Ernest J. King, the uh, head of the U.S. Navy. Yeah. During World War II, there's a similar thing there. Like, because you know, he was a real hard ass, but uh, he also liked just like going to a bar and having a drink. You know, and that's how he also became this notorious womanizer. So everybody's like, you know, I mean, yeah. So he, he was definitely a guy who was who was kind of compartmentalized as well. Yeah, um, and also, he did have frequent outbursts of anger. He was known to dress people down in front of their peers, his subordinates, equals, it didn't matter. And because of that, uh, a lot of people did hate him, but he apparently never took this stuff personally, and he never intended insult. And I don't think he really understood that other people didn't feel the same way that they took these insults to heart. Uh, so for him, he might yell at you. It doesn't mean he, that he has any negative feelings that last beyond that day. But of course, if you get embarrassed, you're going to harbor some resentment. And I don't think Alan B. understood that. Um, so that's part another thing that kind of held him back a little bit. So, I can understand that. Well, I mean, I mean, I mean if Alan B. was a particularly you know, hard man, uh, somebody else's stuff may not have affected him the same way. Or, you know what I also think that is the case, though, too? Uh, he, Alan B himself might have been somebody who responded well to negative reinforcement. Could be, yeah, like a dress, like 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 Alan B is like you know dressing downs work for me; they'll work for you, and you like me better at the end, kid. Yeah, and um, he's kind of like Smith Dorian in the sense that he's also known as a disciplinarian who likes strict training. <laughs> but most of his contemporaries, while they thought Smith Dorian was a great trainer, they thought Alan B was too savage; that he went a little too far. Uh, gotcha. So Allen B was also like that with the soldiers. He wasn't super popular with the troops. Uh, he commanded the BEF Cavalry Division in 1914, later takes over a corps, then an army. And effectively, without going into a lot of details, his performance as a corps and army commander in France was pretty unremarkable. Um, he was neither good nor bad at making tactical adjustments. He made adjustments... And he was about average when it came to thinking up ways to break the stalemate. And he didn't do any notably better or worse than any other commander. So he's pretty undistinguished, actually. So it becomes a bit of a surprise he actually gets tapped for the Palestine Command. Because uh, there was no reason to think that he was anything special. On the other hand, though, he was sort of a generic army commander by that point. So it's not like you're losing somebody you need to hold... Uh, the Marn or whatever, right? Yeah. So he's basically just generic army commander number eight when he's sent to Palestine. But here, he's really in his element. And um, despite the fact that he sucks at making friends with most British officers, apparently he is really, really good at making friends with Arab chiefs. For whatever reason. So the Arab chiefs fucking love this guy. And they also trust him immediately. So they're trying to revolt against the Ottoman Empire. They've been pretty distrustful of previous British commanders. They meet Allen B and they say, now this guy, we, we get him. This guy, we'll work for him. We trust him to 
be good to his word. And he also has a new subordinate once he gets to Arabia. He, he meets uh, T.E. Lawrence, who apparently is also very difficult to work with, but apparently Allenby and Lawrence immediately hit it off and become pretty good with each other. Yeah, they do. Uh, yeah, Lawrence had a very, very high opinion of Allenby, Allenby's military capabilities. Yeah, and also we have to remember Allenby was a lifelong cavalryman and a lifelong... It, it, most of his experience was still with movement warfare. So this command is much more in his words <coughs> than the Western Front, which yeah. is very confined. Um, he also has on his staff a future field marshal we talked about in the World War II video, Archibald Wavell, who uh, hmm. was really impressed by Alan B. and wrote a biography of him later on. And, oh, cool. Um, yeah, so apparently Wavell was a huge fan and admirer of Alan B. as well. Um, so... Allenby, of course, was able to effectively liberate all the Arab parts of the Ottoman Empire. So he undid all the huge disasters early on at Kut and other places. And a lot of this is because the Ottoman military had rotted away due to the Armenian genocide completely fucking up all their logistical networks and killing their morale. Um, but Allenby did his campaign pretty well, despite the fact that it wasn't the hardest campaign in the world, but... Um, it's still complicated in terms of having to deal with the Arabs and uh, figure out sharing territory with the with uh, the French and figuring out how to operate of this vast territory without a lot of water. Because um, you are occupying a huge amount of territory with a pretty small force. He did that pretty damn well, though. And he is being resisted by the German commanders who are in Palestine, so they're not they're not um, starting without a fight, certainly. But Allenby does manage to smash them up. And, um, yeah, actually, if anything, the Palestine campaign is far and away the best British campaign of the war. I don't think it's the case. <laughs> and that's also worth noting that the campaign he inherited when he came into command was not in the best shape. Uh, no, no, it wasn't. I mean, uh, the predecessor he had, Murray, I think is a bit underrated, partially because he's portrayed as, like, a fat, bumbling type in the uh, in uh, Lawrence of Arabia but um um the, the command was not in great was not in great condition although Murray had done uh, had had uh, some successes Yeah I feel like Murray won his first battle and lost the second or something like that um I don't have enough notes yeah. on Murray but he's one of those guys who he's got the reputation of an F but he's definitely better than that um Yeah definitely but um yeah with Allen B how would you rate him? Because I think he's probably a pretty solid A. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, I could see a case for a B, but I'd go A. Yeah. And, I mean, if, if he had just appeared out of the mist, like maybe if he had been sick during the early part of World War One, hadn't taken part on the Western Front, then just went to Palestine and kicked ass, we might be talking S tier, but because we know <laughs> yeah. that he wasn't able to really do that much in the Western Front, I can't go S tier. Yeah. You know, I mean, I mean like... At the same time, though, I mean, is is he like? I mean, he hasn't. I mean, he's a cavalry commander on the Western Front. I can't think of a more pointless job. Yeah, exactly. I mean, because basically, he's leading dragoons who are infantry who have horses they can't use. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's basically what he he was. Um, but yeah, no, he once he found his role because I think Palestine was a job custom made for him. For whatever reason, his personality might have rubbed a lot of British people the wrong way, but. He got on great with the Arabs. And it's actually well, interesting because remember Anderson from World War II, uh, the British commander in North Africa. Apparently the other British commanders thought he was an asshole, but the Americans all thought he was pretty cool. Yeah, there's something, something to note about that too. Uh, did Alan, Do you think Allenby might have been in some way or felt himself something of an outsider? Um... I don't know. He, it's possible, I guess. I think he did have some eccentricities, but I don't know how. I mean, that could be a case. If he's getting along pretty well with Lawrence and with the Arab leaders, uh, that just sounds like a classic case of that. I think you could be right about that. Yeah. Well, um, remember how I said at the outset that my notes are a bit limited? We just yeah. exhausted them. <laughs> so we got through. <clears throat> Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We got through ten people. I thought I had twelve. Oh well, 
I can't count. Yeah, but you got three. You got through ten of the absolute biggest names. Yeah. You know, um, I think your overall, it, you know, overall, you're correct. This is not like a collection of military geniuses here by any means. But yeah, there's so much worse in the First World War. Yeah, I mean, this is clearly better overall than what we've seen from the Italians or Ottomans. And a lot of it, too, to be fair, is that the British had a better army than either one of them. Yeah, in particular, that BEF army with the the the, the uh, their ability to put up that much rifle fire was damn impressive. But yeah, in many ways, that is like kind of um, a British tradition, right? Yeah, the high quality small army. Yeah, high um, quality. Small it's sort of the Wellington tradition, I guess. Although I think it goes back before him, but still, I think of it as most associated with Wellington. I think Wellington is the epitome, the apex of it. I mean, you know, there's sometimes it's like try, people try to compare Wellington to Marlboro, and they're very different in many ways. Uh, Marlboro had a had a coalition army, and he had to be as much a politician and diplomat as a military commander. Uh, also, the pace of operations was a little bit slower in his time. Right. I mean, Marlboro, in all those years of fighting, he fought, what, four major field battles that are, that are, and I mean, okay, some other, he fought some other battles too, they're a bit smaller, but like four big ones. Uh, you know, Wellington, uh, he fought a lot of battles. Like a fuckload of battles, but it, the pace of, the pace of operations and the ability of the armies to take casualties and everything is just more intense. Um... Yeah, so it's uh, also Wellington's army is very much a British army. Sure, he has Spaniards with them, and there's a very, very good Portuguese contingent, but it is a British army, uh, and you know Marbo is truly a coalition army. So different circumstances. Yeah, yeah I'm all... I'd like to go over the names at least of the people we're not going to rate, just so that way people know who the other independent commanders are that we'll get to, I guess, some future time. We have, first of all, we have Henry Rawlinson, Charles Monroe, Henry Horn. I believe this is Plumer. Let me find him real fast. Uh, yes, Herbert Plumer, who, of course, was the guy that French preferred to Smith Dorian. Next up, we have Julian Bing, who I believe is Canadian. I could be wrong about that. William Birdwood, Hubert Goff, William Payton. Ian Hamilton, and this I think this is actually a photo from Gallipoli, by the way. Um, mm. Archibald Murray, we've mentioned him earlier. John Nixon, Percy Lake, Frederick Stanley Maud, Charles Townsend, who looks surprisingly heroic, given what we know of what he was involved with. Uh, he's the coot guy. Um, mm -hmm. He's easily the worst British general. Uh, spoilers. Um, George Youngblood, or Young Husband, excuse me, Charles DeBell, Francis Wingate, Charles Douglas, and James Wolfe Murray. So anyway, those are the men who we were not able to go through today, but who we will cover in the future. So anyway. So who was court-martialed for shooting a pigeon? What's this reference to? Who I don't know. Huh. Well, we also got spammed a lot by best cams, fun, hot girls and boys, 18 plus video chat. Cool. Yeah. Uh, we did not get paid for that sponsorship, so uh, I'll be <laughs> checking the mail. Um, we did get a few super chats, though. I guess we can go through those real fast. All right, let's see. Yeah. All right, so our two Super Chats of the evening came to us from, first, Sam Reynolds for four nine for nine ninety nine. Thank you, Sam. He says, and that you probably could answer this one, Sean. Where would you rank the British admirals at Jutland, Jellico, and is that Beatty or Beatty? At Beatty. Beatty. Um. Yeah, uh, Drac did a really good uh, Jutland video, of course. 
Um, and that, I remember I watched it. Uh, and, uh, William William uh, sent me like this uh, Jutland uh, when they did the when the Centennial happened. I, I, he sent me a video, although that video really made it sound like this was some great moment for Britain, which I don't think so. Um, yeah, but Jut Jutland's a weird battle, right? Like the British lose more ships, but the battle convinces the Germans they can never really come out to face them again. So it's you know it's. It is a classic case of a tactical German victory and a strategic uh, British one. Uh, but anyway, um, I would say uh, uh, in the case of Jellicoe, you know, famously Churchill, I believe, said he was the only man who could lose the war in an afternoon. Uh, he overall seems to have done pretty well at, at uh, Jutland. Uh, Jellicoe wasn't a genius, but he didn't need to be. He just needs to maintain that blockade. Uh Beatty, on the other hand, uh, if you're watching Drax video on Jutland, uh, that man can barely contain his dislike for that man. Uh, Beatty could be extremely difficult, and while the loss of all the battle, while the loss of the battle cruisers at Jutland had more to do with things that were out of Beatty's control, like design and the handling of uh, powder and whatnot, he did not. Um, he did not manage the battle well himself. And Beatty could also be very difficult to work with as well. So I don't have a particularly high opinion of Beatty as an admiral. Uh, I think Jellicoe is just fine, and that's exactly what he needed it to be. Uh, that said, at Jutland, I'm actually more impressed with Shear, the German opponent. Actually, Hipper as well. Uh, you know, Hipper did quite well in the battle cruiser fight. And uh, Scheer, Scheer uh, he... Um, the high seas fleet, if they proved one thing at Jutland, is that they were superb at maneuver. Um, and uh, I, I give Cher a lot of credit for that. You know, the German. You think about that. The, the you know, twenty years before Jutland, the Germans barely have a fleet, and then twenty years in, they have a fleet that can compete with the British and win battles against them, and are every bit as good as sailors. Yeah, so the Germans pretty damn impressive. It is it, in naval history. It's 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 kind of insane how good the high seas fleet is, but <coughs> the, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, the thing I just say about the high seas fleet is kind of what I sort of say about the French fleet in the seventeen and early eighteen hundreds. The French fleet at that time is a really good fleet. Unfortunately, it's facing the British at their at their very best, right? Right. And in the case of the high seas fleet, I mean. They're just in a really bad spot, but uh, it's it's insane they're able to build a fleet that that's that good that quickly. And I, overall, I do think that the German battleships were overall better designed than their British counterparts, um, but not like not by leaps and bounds. Uh, so anyway, um, so yeah, it's, uh, that's that's uh, that's just my thoughts on that one. Although I haven't really read read about or thought about Jutland in a minute. Yeah. All right. Well, next up we have one from CS Ventura for 4.99. Thank you, CS. And he says, "Can't wait for the rest of World War One generals. Uh, best content on YouTube. I listen to your streams multiple times, guys. Keep it up." Well, thank you, CS. I appreciate it. Um, we also have one from uh, Reese Trotman for twenty dollars Australian. Uh, he doesn't have a comment, but thank you, Reese. And our last one is from Ed Gee for. Five dollars. Thank you, Ed. And he says, "Great show. Do you think if World War One didn't happen, there would be no Hitler or World War Two? What do you think?" What was the? I'm sorry. What was the question again? Uh, do you what think if World War One didn't happen, there would have been no Hitler or World War Two? Yeah, no reason not to. I mean, <clears throat> you know the. Um, you're going to get, uh, you know, fascism, communism, and Nazism are. I mean, I mean, they have intellectual roots that are uh, that go into the 1800s, of course. But those ideologies can only gain the kind of traction they have with a crisis like the First World War. Uh, you know, apparently, a big thing for Marxists is the fact that there was no communist revolution in the 1890s when you had that massive depression. Right? right. It didn't happen. You know, uh, it didn't happen. And communism instead happened in countries where it wasn't supposed to happen. Um, so, 
Yeah, of course. You know, I mean, come on, you gotta have the first movie to get the sequel anyway, right? Yeah, and also with even you could have still had a war that happened at the same time as World War Two, but the character would have been massively different without World War One. The battle lines could have been different. I mean, Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire might have still been around uh, because without the pressure of World War One, I, I don't know if they'd have broken. Imperial Russia might not have broken either. Um, I think it's also possible if you have a quick resolution to the First World War, which is certainly possible in 1914. 1914 is a bad year for the Central Powers. The offensive into Serbia is a disastrous failure. Uh, the Austro-Hungarian army gets mauled by the Russians. The German drive on France fails, and they lose the Marne and the race to the sea. Tannenberg is what keeps the war going. Yeah. So, so the so I think I think if the Germans lose Tannenberg, Germany actually might have been like, all right, we're out. I mean, that's just. I mean, maybe I'm wrong about that one, but that's that, that's the impression I've gotten from some books I've read is that. You know, it was the fact that they won there that they hung all their hopes on. And also, the not just they won Tannenberg, but they won Tannenberg in the, the most dramatic fashion possible. A brilliant victory. And that's the thing, too. Like, you know, like, like any time you might think about, oh, the stalemate of the Western Front. I mean, the Germans won a brilliant maneuver battle at Tannenberg. Yeah, that's why in many ways, um, now that I learn about more of the other theaters of World War One, I, I tend to find all of them more interesting than the Western Front. Everything from yeah. Italy to like the Caucasus to the <clears throat> Germans versus the Russians. I mean, I find all those to be more interesting and engaging. Interestingly enough, World War One is one of my favorite board game topics. I mean, you've got like Paths of Glory. You also have this great game called To the Last Man, where you actually do the First World War, and the game does trench warfare really well, and it's actually very tense because. Oh. Well, because you're grinding up your enemy, right? Right. But you get the feeling that at any moment the lines could break, and it does happen. And that was not impossible in the First World War. I mean, you know, it's, it's very possible that with, you know, um, with better tactics, better leadership, that the Western Allies in 1915, or even the Germans in 1916, could have broken the front open. You know, I don't think it was impossible. I think it... But... That, that that's a good game. That's a really good game. Uh, that yeah, it's also one of the most brilliant games ever in that sense that nobody really thought you could do that until he did it. Uh, but also this game, uh, I also have his his um, sequel game on the Eastern Front of World War One. And um, what's the other one? Oh yeah, yeah. And then um, I have one called When Eagles Fight. Which is World War on the Eastern Front, and that game's great. That's done. That's also done with the Pass of Glory guys. So, and then uh, you know William, he did a game on Verdun that's really good. Oh really? Uh, the Pass, yeah. I didn't know he yeah, had he did done a... any World War One in France games. Yeah, he. Did. It's actually, it's actually, I think it's his highest rated game. Oh. Um. Yeah, I think it's his highest rating, highest rated game, and. Um, yeah, they shall not pass. And the battle over done. It's not about the whole battle, though. It's just about the opening uh, phase when the Germans attack the trench line and uh, have a have a breakthrough for a moment. Oh well. Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. Um, is he still making games by any chance, or he's still retired? I I, I don't think so. I, I I mean, I'm I'm in the process of retiring. I'm still doing a lot of horse. I'm still do actively do horse and musket. In fact, I just uh, today finished the uh, editing the horse and musket annual, and I've got a few game ideas. And one company wants me to do some uh, Civil War grand theater games, but I'm not really sure. I, I don't think I want to do too much more. I thought about doing a Mexican American War game, but I'm not going to do that. Um, I've got four or five that I still want to do, and I got a few there in the pipe, like Italy um, in World War Two. And Vistula Odor Offensive, I want to do one for, but yeah, I'm not going to be. I'm 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 kind of shifting out of that one. I'd ra I'd rather write. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, I get there's not much money in board games, or is there? Um, and there, there's some money, and actually, Horse and Musket's been pretty lucrative for me since it's actually, 
I'll just say like designed in perpetuity. Or I'm, not, I'm sorry, it's published in perpetuity. So every few months I get an amount of money for how many copies they sold. And uh, I, I never plan to, I always plan to stay with Holland Spiel. So as long as they're open and they offer my game up, I'll have a steady source of income from that. Uh, other games, not as much. You know, and also, I'm going to be honest, uh, COVID rotted people's brains. And I find people in general are a rooter. And even I was for a period of time. But I also found interactions on Board Game Geek with people uh, have been like nails on a chalkboard when they weren't before. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm not really... Um, one of the reasons I'm getting out of it is I don't really feel like... Um, it's just not as fun, and dealing with people online with board games has become more annoying. <laughs> um and also, I, I kind of feel like the whole thing's probably um, is probably on the decline anyway. Uh, William Sariego's top rated board game, ranked board game, Board Game Geek, is uh, Defiant Russia, but They Shall Not Pass is his second one. And They Shall Not Pass is a good game. I like that one. All right, yeah, because he, he usually didn't talk that much about the games he had designed when I was around him, so... I remember it was. I think it was after you had left. I was hanging out with him, and he had a little stack of games. And I realized, oh, those are all ones he designed. And uh... yeah, to my knowledge, he's, he he was just kind of getting out of it. And I think he might have had some problems with the guy who published almost all of his games. That was Avalanche Press, which doesn't necessarily have the best reputation anyway. But I don't want to besmirch him. Avalanche has done some fine games. Um. The last one he came out with, I think, was Western Desert Force. Uh, about the uh, North Africa campaign. Right. Which I've thought about getting. But, you know, I mean, North Africa campaign is one of the most, one of the most simulated ones for, uh, for board games. And I've already got some good ones. Like, I got Hold Fast North Africa. That's a solid game. No Retreat North African Front. Good game as well. Shifting um, Sands. Yeah, Shifting Sands. That one's a bit involved. I like the, that one is you have both the Syrian theater and, of course, East Africa. Yeah. And you have Operation Torch. One thing I did like about Western Desert Force, though, I, I've never played it, but one thing I liked about the game cover is it shows the Italians, which is fitting. They suffered the most casualties uh, of the Axis forces because they had more men, right? Right. Yeah. So... Yeah, that's right. I don't really see any uh, things for uh, Western Desert Force there. Remember that one time we played Shifting Sands? Uh, you drew some card for Operation Hercules. It was oh, yeah, the uh, land of Syria. That was for uh, Crete. Crete, okay. But... Yeah, I remember that one. <laughs> yeah, that was a, I think that was the first war game you ever showed me. And I think about it, as I'd never played yeah. one before, so that was the, my first experience with one. Ah, I remember that. I was running that with you and Michael. Uh, you all did real well. That was fun. That was that was a fun one. That was a good session. You ended up being one that we fought to the bitter, bitter end with because the Axis came very close to winning early. <coughs> uh, the Allies prevailed at the last turn, I think. That's actually something I've kind of found with uh, uh, Shifting Sands. I haven't played it as much as I'd like to, honestly, but um, I've overall found that that is a game where... Um, I've overall found that is a game uh, where it usually does come down uh, to the um, to, to be very close. And of course, another great one is uh, Hannibal Rome versus Carthage. Yeah, that's a good game. Yeah, that's a really good one. That's a really good one. And uh, Hammer of the Scots also like that game, which I guess is a somewhat similar system, right? Actually, you know what we're playing tomorrow? You'll love this. We are playing Napoleonic Wars. Oh, that's a good game. I like that one. Yeah, we did that one a lot. And I did the whole thing, too, with the uh, the variant the guy came up with, where you do the French Revolution. Yeah, we played that once. I, I played as Prussia when we did that. 
Yeah. <laughs> I think I managed to win the game somehow. Uh, you did. I was telling people that. People are like, Prussia can't win. I'm like, yeah, you can. You just got like, to be like through psyches and be an asshole. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, there's, the only way you can win is if you just sabotage everyone else. Because otherwise, there's no way you got the logistics to claim enough territory to win an impressive victory. You have to win a narrow victory. So it's all about balance of power and just turtling. Yeah. <laughs> I remember, I think... Uh, because Michael will get really into these games, so I remember I uh, I forget who I sided with, but I sided with somebody. He's like, "That's not in your interest. What are you doing? We got the ropes." <laughs> I'm like, "Michael, I'm not going to explain my strategy to you, but I'm I'm not a complete idiot. I, there's a logic behind this." Yeah. Because <laughs> I can't let somebody run away with it. If I let somebody run away with it, then I can't possibly win. The only way I can possibly win is if no one's doing super well. Yeah, I'm running it tomorrow. I might play Britain. I might end up playing the British. I'll have to yeah. see. I always wanted to try Britain in that game. Um, I think I've played as every other faction. Actually, I yeah. don't know if I ever played as Russia either. I think it ended up being France, Prussia, and Austria. Well, in that game, what's fun about it is they all play... I mean, they don't seem like they'd play differently, but they do, given their geographic position. So, you know, Prussia's in a tough spot, but if you can really look out for yourself, you can do what you did. You know, France is just a fucking juggernaut, right? Yeah. Um, and one of the things I like about that game is that you can do crazy stuff, but you can't always do crazy stuff. So I did as the French managed to conquer England, like take London. Um... Which was not impossible for Napoleon to do. In fact, I you know I I was able to like you know win a naval battle against the British and then do the invasion. And the peace terms were harsh, so I got like Gibraltar, Ireland became independent. <coughs> um, the British are kind of tough because you have a small army. You have to choose where to land. You have to like figure out where you can uh, where you can get your licks in. Uh, Danny likes playing Austria. He can be really good with them. Uh, Russia, I find, is kind of the least fun because you're in the corner, and nobody can really hurt you that badly, you know. But you also just harder to get things. I I found Russia kind of the kind of the more boring of the group. Yeah, and you also have to be careful about uh, being too predatory toward Prussia and Austria because if you're too predatory, then the French just run away with it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You have to always counterbalance between. Who's in charge? One of the things I love about Napoleonic Wars, besides the rulebook's great. Also, um, uh, the game is, uh, it works. I find it works well, no matter how many people you have, given the way diplomacy works. Uh, so, for instance, I, I have played it as a two-player game, and it's it's actually great. You know? I'd like to play sometime in that game where you have Spain, the Ottomans, and maybe... Uh, Denmark as all and as all player powers. Just see what that would be like to have an actual person controlling the Ottomans. I could see that with Spain, but nobody else, because you know, technically the Turks never really got involved in the Napoleonic Wars. They, I mean, they fought Napoleon in the uh, French Revolutionary Wars, but after that, they really didn't get involved. Uh, so I like them as a country you influence diplomatically. Yeah, although I guess um, there's no reason they couldn't have gotten involved in theory, though, right? I mean, they wouldn't have been yeah. a major power, obviously, but... I think if somebody plays the Turks... You know, the problem with the Turks, too, is that you don't really have many places you can go. Like, you, you, you're pretty much like, okay, you might fight the Russians, you're definitely fighting the Austrians in that game. The way, Just the way the map is. You could fight the British if you invade Italy. Yeah, yeah, if you invade Naples. Um, but I think, like, the Turks are, like... It's like the Russians, where your options are a little more limited, but you're weaker. Which, yeah, you know, but... I mean, I guess it's almost like a what-if thing. Which which goes back to the game Empire, Empires in Arms, which is a classic, overly complicated game with, like, with a hardcore fan base. Yeah. And actually, I think they just made a computer version of it a few years ago. But anyway, Empires in Arms, uh, that game went all the way to where the Turks could be involved. I can see Spain... That's definitely one where I'm like, yeah, you can have somebody be Spain as a player power. Well, uh, also, I remember when I played as France one time, I struggled mightily with my dice rolls in the East, so I wasn't winning those big battles like uh, 
you know, whatever, uh, Elal or whatever the fuck. But in the West, I was unbeatable. <laughs> and it was all because of dice. Uh, so in the West, every time I'd face the British, the British Army just get blown off the field completely. Um, so it, they got so weak at one point, I was actually able to take my Spanish allies and successfully invade Britain. Wow. <laughs> but that, even though that was amazing, it did not offset the frustration I felt in the East. Because even the battles I won were all Pyrrhic. I could not get a clean victory, and I also had a few marshals that got killed in action, too. Including the good ones, and not, not like the shitty ones. So I, mm. I couldn't buy a victory, but... Uh, yeah, anyway, um, we got a couple more Super Chats here. We have Old Man from Berlin for $2. Thank you, sir. He said, if you had to fight, would you rather be on the Eastern Front of World War II or the Western Front of World War One? Uh, Western Front of World War One. I. I would want no part of the Eastern Front of World War Two, ever. Yeah. That's like. That's that. That's like that's like getting involved with some Mongol conquest shit. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if anything, the, I mean, because the casualty rates on both are tremendously high. I guess at least in World War One, even though the trenches were filthy and smelled like shit, I mean, you did have some downtime. Um, and the weather was not nearly as horrible as the weather on the Eastern Front. So I guess I would also have to go with Western Front. Either way, you're probably going to die, though. Yeah. Um, okay. Next up we yes. have... Oh, go ahead. <laughs> quite true. Either way, you're probably dying. <laughs> yeah, but hopefully you won't be quite as cold before you die if you're on the Western Front. All right, uh... Sean Mack for $5. He has a quote for us. The German fleet has assaulted its jailer, but it is still in jail. Yeah, that's about right. <laughs> but it, it gave his jailer a hell of a bloody nose. Like, you know, it was not a... It was not a, um... It was not a weak assault. It was a strong assault. <laughs> yeah. I love the, uh, you ever saw the uh, German propaganda poster about that, where they show, um, um, like, they're just, it just shows, like, it just shows how many ships they sank compared to how many they lost. It's very well drawn, too. It's very well drawn. Well, you know, because, I mean, Germans, I mean, for propaganda reasons, trying to say we won the battle, which tactically, once again, they did. They, they inflicted much heavier losses and uh, managed to escape. Yeah. So I guess I guess that's what's always been kind of stuck in the British crawl about Jutland was that they didn't have a repeat of Trafalgar, you know, they didn't get to like, you know, blow up their opponent, slaughter them mercilessly, you know. Right. That is a great quote. It really sums it up. <laughs> that's true. That's a good one. All right. Well, that's all for super chats. I guess we gotta figure out the new schedule. So I mean, we could. Because I know originally, for the next time, or for the May schedule, we're thinking we'd have three streams out of the five Sundays. Uh, I'd probably still stick with the two for myself. I mean, I could possibly do a third one. Okay. If I did a third one, it'd be like Sega Genesis, you know? Okay. Um, so... Maybe we could do, in two weeks' time, we can do the continuation of this, and then after that... I know you had the F-tier thing, and yeah. Roman the second triumvirate. Triumvir. Yes, yeah, so those are the ones that I'm most excited about going forward. Um, so maybe what we could do is do the second triumvirate period, and then after that, <coughs> F-tier. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I feel like we got we got a few more names who need to be in that tournament, so which also means we need to finish this before we get there because uh, Charles Townsend would be perfect for the F tier tournament. <laughs> yeah, um, yes, actually F tier tournament you may want to hold off on until we're done with all of World War One generals, right? Well, that's true. I mean, at the same time, though, there's no reason we can't do another one because I think we've already because I'm planning on doing a sixteen person tournament 
and I think we've already got way more than 16 candidates to be in it from all the things we've done with past tier rankings. Yeah, so, well, I guess you might want to do it. Maybe you want to do a draft with that. That's over what I'm on thinking. Your, uh, yeah, so I'm going to do a draft. So I'm not sure, like, maybe when we do the week we do the F tier tournament, maybe we can have, like, a one weeknight where we spend, I don't know, 45 minutes drafting just to build the uh, suspense and anticipation. Yeah, I did want to mention this to everybody uh, for Forgotten Battles. Um, we are um, we're working on a big video right now. I uh, just saw the intro that um, Lance made, and it's an amazing intro. Uh, really good. And But I did want to say, if anybody can, if you haven't, go check it out, what we do have up, because... Um, right now, algorithm-wise, uh, we're getting punished right now. Our last two videos are the two least performing of all time, and they're not bad videos by any means, especially Battle of the Pips is a lot of fun. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is just the algorithm right now has turned on history, whereas back in December, I mean, everything that every History Channel was making was getting boosted pretty hard. Yeah. But no, I if yeah, I, if anybody hasn't, I definitely recommend checking out those two videos, especially uh, Battle of the Pips, which is Operation Cottage. Yeah, so uh, that's go check out Forgotten Battles when you get the chance. Yeah, that's a really good one. Um, you know, the the latest video in particular is really good. After this one, we won't be doing as much World War II for the rest of the year because we only try to do one or two. We only try to do like two to four World War II videos a year. Uh, as Danny said, they, they get the most views, and they're just there to keep the lights on at this point. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what a lot of it is. I mean, it's great stuff, but it keeps the lights on. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, that's true. Yeah, 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 it's true. I mean, Civil War doesn't do too bad, though. But anyway, um, yeah, that's pretty much all I have for that one. Uh, do you want to do the Brits in about two weeks, then? Finish yeah, them so up, or do you want to do longer? In, yeah, in two weeks' time, and I'll also be sure to send you the official list. So we have, because uh, okay. I know I sent it a long time ago, but it's probably lost deep in your inbox by this point. Definitely. So much shit has happened between now and then. Yeah, so. All right. Well, I guess that's just about it for this evening. So thank you all for joining us. And um, next time we'll finish out looking at the awe-inspiring British commanders from World War One. So... Everybody have a good week. Uh, I'll probably be back before then. I don't know if I'll be on next Sunday or not, but I do plan on uploading a couple of videos that I've been working on for a long time on and off, including the Chagatai Khan 8, uh, one on Marcus Fulvius Flaccus I've been trying to get done since last fall, and some other shit. So anyway, that's all I have, and we will see you in two weeks' time. Remember to check out Forgotten Battles when you get the chance. And that is all for tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Good night. All right. We're done.